Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, January 12th, 2019. This is episode 1556. Just a little program note. There are more ways to listen to this show than ever before, and I just wanted to give you a heads up. Of course, you can download all of our shows, including the Tech Guy podcast, from our website, twit.tv. In this case, twit.tv slash TTG, or the Tech Guy podcast, techguylabs.com. But that's just a onesie twosie thing. You can also subscribe to the podcast feed, and that way you'll get each show the minute it's available, and you don't have to think about it ahead of time. Just whenever you want to listen, you can. Easiest way to do that, go to twit.tv slash TTG and press the subscribe button, or open up your favorite podcast app and search for the Tech Guy. In almost every case, you'll be able to subscribe right there. The other thing you can do, and I think this is kind of cool, with all podcasts, ours as well, is ask your voice assistant to play it. If you have an Amazon Echo, for instance, you can say, Echo, play the Tech Guy podcast. And the most recent version will almost always play. Sometimes with uh, Amazons, you have to say, Echo, play the Tech Guy podcast on TuneIn. But my experience lately has been that's not necessary. But if it doesn't work, that's something to try. You can do it with your Google Assistant as well. Uh, you can even do it with Sora, Siri and uh, Cortana. So if you want to hear the latest show and you're just wandering around in the house, ask your Echo. Now, on with the Tech Guy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Slack. Slack is a collaboration hub for work to make sure the right people in your team are always in the loop and key information is always at their fingertips. Learn more at slack.com. And by DigitalOcean, the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Over 150,000 businesses rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash twit. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Wow, time to talk computers, the internet, home theater. We got your digital photography. We got your smartphones. We got your smart watches. We got uh, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is my phone number. If you want to call and ask a question, make a comment, make a suggestion, well, I, heck, I'd like to hear from you. 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, it still works. You just have to use a Skype out or something like that. 8888-ASK-LEO. I say it a couple of times just because I know, you know, it goes fast. We have it all written down. Uh, you don't have to. Really, all you really need to remember is uh, the website, techguylabs.com. Everything uh, I talk about is written down there. So, it, you know, and almost immediately because uh, if James isn't on vacation, James DeRuvo will be writing it down. Sometimes he takes some time off and we get it all there. CES. CES. Oh, my gosh, what a yawner. The, co <laughs> the Consumer Electronics Show, formerly. It's actually the show known, formerly known as the Consumer Electronics Show. CES is over. And uh, I'm sure there are many people bearing flu germs back to their home cities from Las Vegas. 180,000 people converging on Las Vegas this week. Man, actually, more than that. As somebody pointed out, that's just the registered attendees. There's still many, many more people who come down for the event on the periphery. Scott Wilkinson is going to join us in just a bit. He saw a lot of cool stuff. But remember, <laughs> no, I can tell you right now, there was nothing cool. <laughs> Remember, Scott is a home theater geek. He's going to think it's cool. Uh, maybe And maybe there is in TVs. We'll see. What do you think? You think so? Mm -hmm. uh, we saw a LG TV that rolls up and down. But wait a minute. Didn't we see that last year? Yes, we did. What's new this year? Well, maybe they're going to make it this year. That's the story, literally. Uh, okay. We saw a luggage piece of luggage that will follow you around the airport. But wait, didn't we see that last year? Yeah, we did. But it's worth seeing again. 
oh man it was a lot of weird uh, it's clear we're in a point in the technology sphere where we've invented everything <laughs> there's nothing new to invent and everything you want is there and it's all just incremental improvement that's why apple is uh, plateauing in smartphones you know you can, iphone sales are just flat why because everybody's got one and there's nothing to make you get a new one and it's pretty much the same all all around we're now just really nibbling at the edges of innovation it's not gonna be that way forever i don't think i mean that's you know that's what happens you get a lot of crazy innovation new stuff uh that sinks in people get used to it nobody could think anything new then some crazy person comes along and says, I know, let's turn it on its side. And then said, everything's different. Hasn't, nothing like that has really happened. Well, in terms of uh, computing, probably since 2007, when Steve Jobs brought out the iPhone. And, uh, and we've been iterating on that over and over. Same thing over and over. It's improved. It's a lot better, but you know. Personal computer isn't really any changed in 10 years, has it? Mm-mm. We've got smart watches now, but nobody really cares. Although Tim Cook said something interesting this week, the CEO of Apple. He said, we've actually made more money on our smart watches and our AirPods than we made at the height of the iPod craze. I find that almost impossible to believe. I'm sure he's not lying. I don't understand it. Maybe because these things are so expensive. Well, the iPod wasn't cheap. Also this week, uh, the phone companies got exposed. <laughs> uh, Motherboard, which is, is turning out to really be a, a better and better site for uh, technology, information, and news, broke a big story that the phone companies, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, were essentially just letting anybody who wanted it have your location. Boom. They were AT and T was selling information about where you were to location. I put this in quotes. Location aggregators. Um. Now they say on Thursday we're going to stop selling location data to third party service providers. <laughs> <laughs> now, now they say it. Motherboard revealed that the information was was going from these kind of first stage people that the phone companies were selling it to to like just anybody basically. Uh, the the motherboard article basically uh, had a reporter said, "Well, okay, track me down." And uh, I gave a bounty hunter. This is the headline: three hundred dollars. Then he located our phone. T-Mobile, Sprint, and AT&T are selling access. I think Verizon stopped because they got in trouble last year, right? To a consumer's location data. And that data is ending up in the hands of bounty hunters, bounty hunters and others not authorized to possess it, letting them track most phones in the country. Shouldn't be much of a surprise you after all this phone that we carry around is, you know, it's like a bug, right? It's like a, a, a location tracker plus microphone plus camera. And when you put an app on it, we've also learned this, by the way, that, you know, the apps are loaded onto your phone and immediately ask for location permissions and start sending that out. The Weather Underground, where, where, I'm sorry, weather.com, wasn't it, that was doing that? Of course, Facebook. Do you care? I don't know if you care. Do you care that anybody in the country can find out where you are at any time? I think there's some people who would very, very much care about that if you had, a, you know, an enemy a stalker. You don't want that information. T-Mobile said, we're completely ending location aggregator work in March. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is January. In March. Verizon said, it too is winding down its four remaining location sharing agreements. With, they're with roadside assistance services. Okay. But I mean, honestly, wouldn't it be better if when your car broke down, you then pushed a button that said, okay, send my information. You know this isn't over, right? You understand that. 
We've said, I've said many times uh, before that if you put something on the internet, it would be prudent, it would be wise to assume that it's out there, that anybody can see it, and never put anything on the internet you wouldn't want your grandma to see. I think that's a, still an important rule. Well, now we have to add this rule. If you don't want people to know where you are, don't carry location tracking devices. And I don't think there's anything you can do about it. I think we're kind of stuck. If you carry a smartphone, you really can't control your location, the information about your location. Just very frustrating. And we all need to carry a smartphone. That's the problem. <clears throat> I tell people, get off Facebook. That's a nightmare. That's a privacy nightmare. They say, but I can't. I can't. I need to. I have to have it. That's how I keep track of people, where my family is, what they're up to. Can't get rid of the smartphone. I need it. Somebody's saying in the chat room, Twisted Mister, your car tracks you too. Oh, I know my car tracks me. It tracks a lot more than where I am. I drive a Tesla, which means that Elon sees everything. When I hit the brake pedal, when I hit the accelerator, I know that because I, when I first got the Tesla, I would put it, I thought I would put it in reverse and it would go forward. I thought this is a problem. My wife and I both had this experience. Called Tesla. They said, well, let's check. Okay, when did that happen? No, we're just seeing your log here. You pressed the, uh, you, were in, you were in drive. Wait a minute, you know what I was doing? Oh, we know what you're doing. We know where you are, what you're doing. When you take a left turn, when you take a right, we know all of that stuff. We live in a new age where everybody is tracking everything we do. You know why? Because it's valuable. It's really valuable. There's a larger concern down the road. I, I don't know if I want to get into this right now, but at some point we should talk about this. I interviewed yesterday a woman named Shushana uh, uh, Zoboff, who wrote a book is coming out on Tuesday called Surveillance Capitalism. And it was terrifying because, you know, she acknowledges what we just talked about. Everybody understands that, right? This isn't even uh, a surprise. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, your cell phone carriers, they're all tracking you. They all know everything about you. Turns out that's valuable. And, and I think we all understood it's valuable for advertising. Okay, fine. You could target advertising. In a way, I think there's a benefit to that, right? Because you're going to get ads that you're interested in, and you won't get ads, we hope, that we are not uh, for stuff we don't want. That's fine. But it's gone beyond that, and that's where it's starting to get concerning is, is uh, behavioral modification. First, they want to figure out what you like. Then they want to predict what you're going to buy. Then they want to convince you to buy or vote or participate. They want, see, this is what's going to be a real battle coming up. But I, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on that because uh, I want to take your calls. 8888 Ask Leo. Your phone calls coming up next. Give me a ring. We give you Kim Schaffer. This is not my choice for music for you, but I just want you to know. You have given approval, however. Right. You're honored. You're flattered. I'm, honor I'm flattered. Yes. <clears throat> Big Pee Wee. I'll take it. I think Big Pee Wee has a crush on you. Big Pee Wee has more energy than any human being. Isn't he being. awesome? I love hearing his interactions with you. That <laughs> The listeners can't hear that, no. but it's awesome. <laughs> He's our musical director. He's got such and, a positive uh, attitude. You give this guy a baton and stand back. Yep. Uh, and you are our phone angel. I am. See, I think we should have phone angel, phone <laughs> angel. But that's a little old-fashioned. It's very old. Yeah. Uh, and you're not, but you are the person who is taking our calls today at 8888 Ask Leo Kim Schaffer, mm -hmm. as always. Yep. And, um, you know, how did you have a nice week? I guess I should ask, I should like, did. you know, ask yeah, you how you do it. It was and a good week. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, it's wonderful to see you. Who should I, uh, who should I start with here? How about Joe in Arizona? He wants to buy his girlfriend a smartwatch and he's Ooh. got a model in mind, but Ooh. he wants to know more about smartwatches in huh. general, I think. This is a complicated, <laughs> a minefield, if it were, if you might uh, say. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Hello there, Joe. Hi, Leo. How well, are you? I'm wonderful. Welcome to the show. Can you hear me okay? I'm driving. Yeah, I hear you fine. Pay attention to your road, though. Don't don't uh, sacrifice yourself for the show. No, sir. 
Um, I'm using a Blue Tiger Elite, which is the best Bluetooth. If you, it sounds ever. awesome. Are you a trucker? Yeah. 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 I'm out on I-40 coming into Winslow, heading for L.A. right now. You're heading down the road, try to loosen your load. Got a, isn't it Winslow, Arizona? Yeah. Got a bunch of women on my mind. Well, hello, Joe. They got a statue of Don. They got a statue of Don Henley of the Eagles. No Winslow. kidding. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, because no one ever heard of Winslow until that song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's not much there. <laughs> well, take it easy, as as uh, Don would say, and drive safe. But what can I do for? By the way, say that again. It was the Tiger. Blue Tiger Elite. Blue Tiger Elite. I'm not familiar with that one. I know a lot of uh, the headsets that uh, drivers use because. Uh, I talked to a lot of them, and of course, yeah. noise cancellation is is number one for you guys because it's noisy up there in the cab. Yeah, I actually had the window open there for a little while. I can't hear a thing; it's dead silence. Yeah. The only thing I can hear is your breathing. Move the boom a little uh, farther away from your uh, mouth or your nose. That's the only thing I can hear. But otherwise, I'm the quality. Nervous. Don't be nervous. Don't be. Ner I'd be more nervous if I were in your shoes right now driving. Uh, so what can I do for you, Joe? Um, okay, I just have a couple of quick questions about the the watch, and I'd also like to mention something about the the uh, location thing. Yeah, a kind of little trivia. I, I'm a local guide for Google, so I take pictures, you know, and all that stuff. I do that too. Up. Yeah, trying to be helpful, uh, right? We're trying to be helpful, right? And I just got an email from him. Uh, I don't know, a week or two ago. And I, could, I leave it on all the time because I use my phone every right. day for multiple things. And they said I went 89,000 miles. <laughs> I went to 256 different cities. Wow. 25 different Walmarts. And, and uh, that I, was, I, I missed four months because I had to have an operation. So I my, get my, that email, too, but you got me here. beat easy. <laughs> Although, uh, because I, I fly a lot, I travel a lot, I might have some more mileage than you. But, I have, but I, you know, that's yeah. cheating. That's cheating. I said I could uh, go around the world two and a half times. Wow! So. Wow! Yeah. See, I you know this is this is an interesting question because Google this is great this is cool this is interesting, uh, and it's great that Google makes that available to you. They're also making it available to other people. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, I don't have anything to be afraid of. If they want to find, I had a I, I worked I had a security clearance for a while. They know where I'm at. If they want to find me, they know where I'm at. So, Are you self-employed or do you work for a company? I work for a company now. So they're tracking you too, of course. Sure, on the Qualcomm. Yep. yep. They yep. know exactly where I am. Yep. And that's reasonable because you're driving something pretty valuable. Sure. <laughs> yes, sir. Brand new, too. <laughs> oh, nice. What are you driving? I have a international. It's called an LT. Nice. It's a brand new. 18-wheeler? Yes, sir. I've got nice. 42,000 pounds of meat from Iowa going to Ooh, L.A. Yum, yum. Stop on by my yeah. way. So uh, <laughs> you uh, you want to buy a, a watch for your girlfriend, yes. okay. Kim said. Yeah. Last time I talked to you, I was in the buying mode, too. But this time, uh, okay, so she's she's techie, right? She's got a Nexus 5. We had I, I just went up to the Pixel 3. And she's she's good with tech. I, I don't. I don't think she's really going to like to watch a whole lot. But one thing I'd like to. I'd, I'd like to know is if. It, okay, for instance, if if she leaves her phone in the car, will and if she runs into the gas station, will the will the the uh, NFC still work? Yes, it will. Okay, well, that's now, well, use. actually, it depends what you get. So, unfortunately, because she's on Android, you can't get an Apple Watch, and that would be yes would be the answer with the Apple Watch. Once you, the Apple Watch senses that it's on your wrist, and once it's unlocked, either by the phone or the pin, you can use it to buy stuff even if the phone is not with you. That's a nice feature of the Apple Watch and Apple Pay. But yeah, uh, then doing it on Android means you have to have a watch that does it on Android, and that's, I think most of the new Wear watches will do that. Hang on just yeah, a sec. Is, uh... Hang on just a sec. I got to take a little break. Scott Wilkinson's coming up with his CES report. He says there were cool things. We'll find out what that is next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So, uh, are you looking at Android Wear? What kind of watch are you looking at for? 
it's, it's a Michael Kors. Uh, oh, that's a nice runway. Yeah. And I think that's yeah, Andrew it has, uh, Yeah, it's 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 version two, so it, it has. It's the best one of all the fancier watches. It's it's the only one that has, uh, you know, pretty much everything. It's waterproof and all that good stuff, and and, and it's good looking, which is nice because, yeah. uh, you know, most of these smart watches are pretty darn nerdy looking. Uh, yeah. This is this is quite pretty, I think. She's <clears throat> the manager for a major store, and yeah, she can't wear some geeky horse purses. And no, oh, there you go. Well, I think that's a heck of a nice uh, present. I think you're doing, and and it has nice face. Or oh, are you gonna get her? Are you gonna get her a jewel encrusted one or just a plain one? That I'm gonna ask a girl about tomorrow in the, in the office. Yeah, because they make them. Yeah, the one is kind of gaudy. I think. I, I think you're, the Sophie is a little gaudy. I think the runway is actually the right yeah. choice. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. But what do I know? But yeah, that's. Uh, She's not a very gaudy person in the first place, but this is stylish. So, it's a you know I think it's a good choice, and I, she can make it a little more gaudy by changing the face. It supports Google Pay, which is uh, Android's version of you know Apple Pay, and I think it works quite well. It works everywhere Apple Pay works because it's basically touch to pay, and so that's a standard. I use it everywhere. Yeah, I use it everywhere around the country. Yeah. So. Um, and I'm just gonna. What your question though is, is an interesting one. If does it if it doesn't, and I haven't used the new Watch OS 2.0, so I don't know if. Let me just see if Google Pay works away from the watch. I mean, away from the phone. Because that's that's your question. I think it's a good question. I actually um, like the Huawei. But, uh... <clears throat> Here's the deal. Too ugly. Like yeah, it's very ugly, but the Huawei technology is very good. So here's here's if if your watch supports Wi-Fi, it can stay connected to your phone at any distance when they're both connected to the internet. Okay. Uh, if your watch and phone aren't connected on the internet, you cannot use Google Pay. So that's kind of a that's kind of a, a bummer. That's I'm looking at Google's notes on this one so that that is not going to really work for her because you know you can't like leave your phone in the car and go into a store and still be on the internet oh but if the phone is with her then it would it would work yes because it's paired to the phone the trick i think there you know the the reason the apple watch can do it is it has well actually it's not the reason the apple watch can do it but it has uh you can put uh, LTE in the watch. Let me see. Pay, right. pay with your smartwatch. Yeah, I I feel like... I would get her the Apple Watch if it works, but... It wouldn't. You she need to get an iPhone. She need to change everything. Yeah. I got her I, I got her broke on the iPhone. So I, I, uh, she's still got an iPad, but uh, she likes the Nexus. She doesn't even want a new phone. No, it's a great phone. It's a great phone. Yeah, it looks like Google Pay is... is see, the well, the watch, Apple Watch, just... Uh, it stores it in the watch securely. It, well, this is a really... You know, you've, you've stumped me a little bit. As far as I can tell, it does not work if you're not with the phone. But let me ask somebody in the chat room uh, what's going on with the latest Wear OS and if there is a way to do that. If you, if you get the Michael Kors runway... If that'll work, I will keep listening. Okay, I will, Leo. Thank Joe, you. Joe, so thank you. Great. Have fun in Winslow. <laughs> Been watching you a long time, buddy. Ever since Screensavers. So. Oh, thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. That sure went way down. It went way downhill after you left. That's right. It did, I, didn't it? it Turn into the. I didn't even watch it anymore. No, it was painful. It was stupid. <laughs> it was, I know. The, I know the skinny guy was a super geek and everything, and the girl was pretty, but the girl was, was pretty. She but. became a movie star. But, uh, yeah, Olivia Munn. <sighs> hey, it's time for Scott Wilkinson. Bump, de bump, de 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 bump, eh, oh. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's time once again for the home theater geek, Scott Wilkinson. How many miles, Scott? How many miles? <laughs> 24.68. That's almost a marathon. That's right. 
uh, well over 50,000 steps. So I got my 10,000 steps a day in, no problem. Wow. <laughs> wow, I am so impressed with you. Well, so impressed. you know, those who, who exhibit at CES probably put, you know, 0.1 mile on their pedometer for the whole show because they're stuck in the booth. Yeah. They're but I have to go around and see everything. I don't know whose feet hurt worse, so those people have to stand yeah. all day and talk all yeah. day. Yeah. Now, we had a little disagreement earlier on the show. I was saying, <laughs> CES, what a waste of time. You said, no, it was great. Tell me what you saw that it made CES great. great. There was a, there, you know, I focus on TVs and some audio. And I will say regarding audio that audio, high end audio anyway, at the Venetian Hotel has gone way, way down. So that wasn't nearly as exciting. But in the world of TVs, there's some pretty impressive stuff going on. One of the most cool things I saw was uh, something that's been around for a while, but now we're finally going to see it in actual consumer TVs. It's called dual modulation LCD. So you know how LCD TVs work. You have tiny little LCD uh, cells and a light passes through them and they brighten or dim more or less uh, according to how bright that particular pixel or subpixel needs to be. But they can't get super deep blacks, which is why OLEDs are my favorite TV technology because it can get down to super deep black, zero black essentially. Well, with dual laser, dual uh, modulation, sorry, uh, you put a second LCD panel behind the one that's producing the color image. And that second one behind the, uh, the main one uh, basically is only black and white. It, but it dims and brightens almost each pixel individually. And it basically squares the native contrast ratio. So if each of these two panels has a native contrast ratio of 1,000 to 1, the combined contrast ratio of the two of them is a million to 1. And that's native. That's not even with local dimming behind the in, in the backlight. So uh, Hisense was showing this. Uh, Skyworth, which is a Chinese company that's not really available in the U.S., was also showing this. And the Hisense example was showing almost 3,000 nits of peak brightness and a black level of 0. 0.0003, which is really, really low. And it has essentially two million dimming zones. So it really addresses a serious limitation of LCD in a, in a brilliant way, I think. So, so this is particularly useful for high dynamic range, right? HDR. Correct, correct, correct. That's exactly right. Which virtually all TVs, at least from the midline up and from most companies, they are. They have right. high dynamic range capabilities. And we're seeing more and more content with high dynamic range coming out and and this is going to be the standard going forward so, so tell me the name is micro led is that what it is no no it's called dual layer modulation oh uh, dual generically D -L -M. generic m how about that dual, hey i like it dual layer modulation okay right, and right. who's going to make this and when well hisense uh demonstrated it and i don't know if we'll see it in a product this year or not we might it's it's a it's a distinct possibility, I would say. So this is one of those new technologies that's coming. It is coming. one of these new technologies yeah, that's yeah. coming. The yeah, other one exactly. was micro micro LED, right? Right, exactly. And we saw that also at CES in in a number of cases. Samsung, which showed it last year, but it didn't come out as a consumer product, only as a B two B type product. But this year, Samsung showed a seventy five inch four K micro LED. Now, what this nice. is is each each individual pixel is a tiny little microscopic trio of LEDs, a red, a green, and a blue. So it's what's called direct emissive display. So there's no light passing through anything. These LEDs just emit light on their own, red, green, and blue, in a tiny, tiny, tiny little trio or triad. And there are 8 million of them on a 4K display. Wow. And... And, and and they can get so bright. I mean, we're talking, <clears throat> well, Hisense had one in their uh, display booth, and they said that they were achieving 10,000 nits, which is the peak, the maximum that HDR allows. It blinds you. 
It would blind you. It absolutely <laughs> would blind you. It absolutely would. Now, if you – and the weird thing or the cool thing about micro LED is you could have the entire screen – be that bright. You Yikes. can't do you can't do that with LCD or OLED no, or any other technology. No. Now you wouldn't want that. <laughs> right. I mean that would no. You know, it's more that, for like if you're uh, I don't know if you're seeing Sandra Bullock floating in space in gravity and exact. the sun there's yep. a little what they call a specular highlight. The sun Correct. hits uh, Correct. just a little piece of the windshield and it right. flashes at you. That kind of thing. Now if that's ten thousand nits and just that tiny little bit. Man, that looks like reality. It really literally. is beautiful, yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Are these so, uh, going to be available this year, you think? Yeah, yeah. I think Samsung said they were coming out this year. And uh, Hisense, uh, that was more of a of a technology demo that they were that they were coming up with. But so, Samsung's 75-inch will be out. The micro LED is the first technology since OLED mm -hmm. that uh, is different. You know, So we've had Correct. LCD for a long time. We had plasma. Yep. It came and went. It came and went. Uh, nobody makes plasma anymore. And OLED yep. has kind of taken over for plasma. So this yep. micro LED is kind of like OLED uh, yep. in the sense it's direct view, right? It's emissive. Correct. It, yeah. it emi the, each pixel emits its own light rather than being... Unlike Ask LCD, through. which is a shutter Correct. effect on backlighting. It's a transmissive type yeah. display. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So that's and exciting. And how expensive many, do you think these will well, be? Well, of course, nobody t was talking prices. Yeah. <laughs> Hardly anybody ever does. But I wonder if they're, if they're hard to make and expensive to make or... Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I, I heard some speculation that the 75-incher was probably going to be in the fifty sixty thousand dollars $60,000 range. Oh, uh, uh, Okay, that's a, little, oh, <laughs> that's a little more than I was thinking, yeah. Well, okay. you know, it, it, these things at this point are extremely expensive to make uh, because you have to you have to be perfect. You cannot have a single pixel out of alignment yes, right. or or that fails because well, you think can about see it that. easily. You're placing, as you said, uh, what did you say, millions? Eight million, million pixels? Eight, eight, eight million, million little yeah. tiny LEDs? Yeah. Eight and million these, on and a these screen? LEDs are like are like a tenth <laughs> of a millimeter or a hundred microns wow. between them. So it's very, very That's precise, awesome. very difficult to do. But man, oh man, that once that technology becomes more affordable, and of course with everything digital, it will. Uh, I heard some some reports about being able to make them a little easier than simply what's called pick and place. You take each one and a robot takes each one and picks it and places it Holy uh cow. If, if you make the whole if you uh, fabricate the whole thing all at once it does become a little easier right so it'll come down in price but of course all new technology is expensive yeah yeah, yeah. Course, although right? that is you know? more expensive than the first <laughs> the first oleds the first plasmas well, that's really true. up there yeah that's, well yeah i mean the first plasmas you remember were like Fifteen thousand dollars for a yeah. forty-two inch. Not fifty. Fifteen. No, no, that's true. Yeah. That's true. These are, I'll, these are, I'll, this is expensive. Yeah, it uh, is. That gives you some indication of that uh, how yeah. hard it might be to make. Anything else you saw that? You, you oh, tons, tons. Uh, you got thirty seconds, so don't <laughs> give me one. Don't, okay, uh, artificial intelligence video processing, AI video processing, has come a long way. Oh, interesting. And it's doing some amazing things to upscaling because with eight K TVs, of which there were a million. Uh, you have to upscale lower free, lower content because there's nothing available in native 8K yet. Scott That's Wilkinson, awesome. he's our foot sore home theater geek. <laughs> we'll talk again next week. Thank you, Scott. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Wow. All right. All right. So some cool new technologies. Some cool new technologies. And I, we didn't even get to the laser illuminated 4K ultra short throw projectors like the Hisense you have. Are they doing three now? Now they're doing three lasers. So they, we had the original one laser. Then right. they then they get loaned us the two laser, which is quite yep. beautiful. Yep. Uh, I thought much better than the one. Is the three that much better than the two? It, I couldn't tell you from the demo on the show floor because it was so overblown, oversaturated. Yeah. And they were they weren't using the the best screen for it. And the guy at the high sense guy I talked to said I tried to swap it out and they swapped it back and. <laughs> So I thought the was screen was part was integral was part of the deal. Well, in, in this case, it, it will be absolutely, and they'll they'll ship a good, appropriate screen with it when it ships, and it's going to ship this year. Nice. Um, 
but uh, the, for the demo at CES, they happened to not have the right screen, and so it didn't look as good as it could have. Um, but um, Chris at, at Hisense did say that he expected to to bring one up to the studio. Oh, and uh, well, how and, exciting! <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, and I mean. Red, green, and red, green, and blue lasers. All three of the primary colors coming from lasers gets you so much more color yeah. than any display, other than a three laser digital cinema projector in a Dolby Vision cinema. Right. Uh, you know, it's it's truly astounding. In fact, I'm concerned, and I, I hope I get a chance to come up and play with it myself. Um, <clears throat> my big concern is how to get that extreme range of color uh, dialed back to where the range of color that current content uses it's actually this this the display is actually more color. capable too much color it is it wow. is so wow. you have we're gonna have to be able to dial it back <laughs> somehow and i'm looking forward to finding out how well that works wow very interesting uh, um but uh, lg had its second generation of ultra short throw laser projector uh, which is probably going to be in the five thousand dollar range. Yeah, but Optima, theirs doesn't come with a screen. Correct, correct. Uh, Optima announced one, so showed one that, that will be available end up this year. Would you getting a screen that would make up the price difference, or could you use oh, it with a less high quality well, screen? Well, well, the 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 screen that Hisense provides is a pretty high end expensive screen. It's very expensive because it's a it, it's a kind of lenses in it basically. Yeah, I yeah, thought that yeah. that was kind of key to the short throw is that it It is. It is. It is. Uh, so will example, the LG work with a traditional screen or do you No, have to no, it, it needs a UST screen. Oh. Uh, ultra short throw screen. Okay. Uh however, Elite Screens makes one. You can buy it on Amazon for 1100 bucks. Okay. All right. Which is so not that bad. So that plus 5 <clears> or or the in the case of the Optima three three thousand dollars. Wow! Uh, you know you're how, well under. How big is that screen? The, Hundred inches. Oh, so it's the same size. Same size. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. Exactly right. So there was some good uh, good progress made in ultra short throw projectors, uh, which I thought was great. Uh, laser illuminated short throw projectors. Right. Right. Um, we talked about AI video processing. Yeah, which I want to talk, actually talk more about that. Sure. <clears throat> Maybe we should do another segment. I feel like hey, I'm, I'm, I got segment. more than enough. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's do another segment then. Sure. All right. Get down on it. Mm hmm. I thought we <laughs> would uh, <clears throat> keep Scott Wilkinson around because I don't think we really got to a lot of the stuff. So there's so much at CES. And uh, while the cut, see, remember, I didn't go to CES. So the coverage I saw was all dopey stuff. And that's what pe a lot of people do. They cover the dopey stuff because it's, you know, it's dopey. weird. Yeah. Because it's dopey. Right. I, I'm specifically looking for advances in display technology. Yeah. And I saw a bunch of them. So so we covered the dual layer modulation, something Hisense yep. will be doing. Maybe not this year. Maybe not. The micro LED, which Samsung will do this year, but at a yep. price far beyond that of mortal man. <laughs> yeah, it's you, true. We, we ran out of time, and actually I wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, upscaling. Now, upscaling is uh, an imp you know a way that the software, or the, the, the actually often the chips in the TV, yes. can improve the image, take a standard definition image and make it high def, take a high def image and make it 4K, maybe uh -huh. even on these new 8K TVs, which I want to yep. ask you about too, take a 4K image and make it 8K. Correct. Doing a good job with that uh, is uh, is hard, hard, but can make a huge difference, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I saw many demos uh, as I ex as I expected, and as I talked about last week on the show, 8K was going to be a huge video story, and it was. Everybody had 8K displays that were going to that are going to be available this year. Despite the but lack of 8K content. The problem is there's no 8K yeah. content. We've except been here for before, a little. But... We have been here before. We, we were here with 4K, and now there's a bunch of 4K content. Right. So it's going to happen. Although I will say I heard a number of broadcast-type people and people who work in the industry, they're scared to death of 8K because they're just barely getting to 4K yeah. now. It's, it's a, it adds being, a lot of uh, complexity. If You know, yeah. the amount of data is, again, quadrupled, which yep. means... 
uh, it, uh, your entire workflow, uh, you yep. know, computers, uh, yep. and everything that uh, yep. are are not adequate to handle it. It's very slow. Exactly. This exactly. we went through this with HD. We went through it with 4K. That's um, right, and we're doing it again now. Yeah. So, in other words, you need good upscaling to take. 4K or HD or even SD or streamed content, which usually looks like crap, um, and upscale it to 8K. And the advance, advances that have been made in video processing using artificial intelligence, machine learning, some people called it deep learning, uh, is remarkable. I mean, I saw a bunch of demos of 4K on one side and 8K on the other side, both being fed the same 4K signal. Um, and the 8K just looked better. Yeah. I mean, it was remarkable. And, the, you know, so they're basically synthesizing three new pixels for every pixel that's in the actual signal. And in the early days, they would have just sort of repeated pixels. But now they're actually interpolating and doing some pretty amazing things. I saw a few examples that looked overhyped over sharpened you know you've seen that sometimes you see edge enhancement that looks kind of really cheesy and i saw a couple of examples of that but i also saw some examples that looked phenomenal just like wow so if you think about it this actually makes sense to make this a uh, a machine learning uh, problem because the problem if you don't if you don't know what those extra three pixels are is you just either you guess or you repeat mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And both exactly. of those produce poor results. But if Correct. you had, if you were able to, using machine learning, could kind of predict what those other three pixels yes. would look like, yes. you might yes. get closer to the real thing. And as machine learning gets better, I'm yep. choosing, by the way, the term machine learning over artificial intelligence. because Okay, that makes it, sense. It's really what it is, is, it is that yeah. the, 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 pro the software and the processors have been trained on a lot of AK images. And they, and they say, oh, I get it. This is what right. should be in those extra three dots. Right, right. So it's Man, machine most, learning. In most, yeah, in most cases, they they have a big database of types of images, and so that helps. Exactly, yeah. But the, but the processor is going to learn over time uh, what it needs to do, and the, the results I saw were really quite astonishing. Yeah, I think they'll get better and better. Yeah, I do too. Samsung not, has it, clear, Sony has it. They probably aren't going to learn on your TV as you use it. They're learning, they have to learn ahead of time. It's unusual that they would learn from your existing Well, you know, that's a, you know, that's a very good question. Whether or not once you get the TV, will They're, they learn not. more over Trust time? Me. I, Trust me. Okay, all right. <laughs> they may all imply right. that. They may want you to <laughs> think that. I'd be, but I'd it be used surprised. To be the, yeah, it used to be that AI processors were mostly for voice control, you know, like Alexa and right. Google Assistant, that sort of stuff, or for content um, recommendation. You know, you've you've watched this kind of stuff before, so here we think you'll like this too. But this is video processing. This is Im upscaling, uh, uh, color correction, that kind of stuff, and it's it's come an awfully long way. Yeah, yeah, very really impressive. amazing. Yeah. yeah. What else did you see? Well, uh, laser illuminated ultra short throw projectors. We were talking about this offline, and uh, you've seen this before. You had the high sense in the studio. We, this high sense is beautiful. We got the original it, single laser, uh, then they replaced it with the dual laser, which was more, really much better. Yep, and now they're yep. doing three: red, green, and blue. They're not they're not Correct. simulating the third color. Better. Correct. Correct. Better. Well, yes and no. The demo that I saw was not ideal, and they admitted that. Uh, and the pro part of the problem is that lasers produce a very pure color, as you know. That's the definition almost of laser. And so the red, the green, and the blue primary colors are so saturated that they're, they produce way outside of the range of colors that content is mastered to. Mm. So it looks almost cartoonish if you let it run full scale. So you need to be able to rein it in to where it needs to be. And I really am looking forward to checking out this dual, this trichroma, they call it trichroma uh, projector, to see if we, you can rein it in. And if you can, which I assume you probably can, then you're going to get exactly the color space, the color range that, the content creators use to create the content and mm -hmm. you're going to see it exactly as they intended. I'm very excited about this. It's not just Hisense anymore either. There's No, other exactly. LG had their second generation uh, with dual laser like the Hisense you have now. 
Uh, and Optima uh, showed the P1, which is a single laser solution, but it's three thousand oh, dollars, which is very low. And I, yeah. now you asked earlier about buying a screen. Well, what about the screen? The Hisense comes with a screen. Now, That's these true. require special short throw screens. Correct, they do. But you can get them for not too bad. I mean, the um, Elite Screens makes an ultra short throw screen, ambient light rejecting too, which you need, so you can watch it with the lights on like a living room TV. Uh, for you can get it for eleven hundred bucks on Amazon for a hundred inch screen. So in the past, the disadvantage of a pro the advantage of a projector is you can get it really big. This is a hundred really inches. big. The disadvantage yeah. is you'd have to kind of have it all set up, and the projector has to be a certain distance and so forth. These right. short throw don't take up much more room than a regular TV because the projector's right in front of the screen. It's eight inches That's away. Right. That's so you right. really put it where you would put your TV. You put the screen above it. Yep. And it, it, you've got a 100-inch TV for a lot less. Correct. For a you know, 100-inch LCD or OLED TV, if you can get one, and you now can, uh, 8Ks are coming uh, as high as 98 inches, but they're going to be way more expensive than that. Yeah. So, and plus the fact with a regular projector, if you walk in the beam of light, you obviously cast a shadow and you might blind yourself. It's really not a good thing. <laughs> go, <laughs> soak, go soak your feet, Scott. I thank you thank for your you. great I... coverage of the Consumer Electronics <laughs> Show, for, the show formerly known as the Consumer Electronics Show, CES right. in Las Vegas, and for uh, giving me, once again, faith that new <laughs> things are being invented. We have yes, not hit a plateau. Are. Thank you, Scott. Nope. Hey, a real quick note for our friend Joe, the truck driver. I've investigated, and yes, Android Wear will work when separated from the phone. You'll have to check in to the Internet once every 24 hours, but otherwise it will work. So that Michael Kors runway will be perfect for your girlfriend. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up right after this. Stay here. Yeah. <laughs> you does yeah. song. All yours, Mr. Scotty. Thank you. I shall give you the timer and all of those oh, things. Oh, the timer would be great. Yes. Emily the Strange writes, <laughs> what a world, complaining about too much color. Too much color. <laughs> I love that. You know, eventually, we, we may very well see... Uh, uh, content mastered in what's called BT 2020. Although that's a slight misnomer, but I don't want to get into that. Uh, bottom line is that's where lasers live. And no display except for laser displays can do it. So movies and now consumer content are mastered in, in a smaller range of colors called DCI P3. And so and there's no content that's actually mastered to 2020 with one exception that I know of, which is, do you remember the movie Inside Out Pixar animation of the, the voices in our heads? Very, very good movie. I really enjoyed that movie. There was one scene, if you remember the movie, uh, when joy and sadness, two of the voices in uh, Riley's head, uh, enter into Riley's deep subconscious where they encounter the birthday clown that actually scared Riley as a child. And so he lives in the deep, deep unconscious. The scene in that, that scene in the deep unconscious was done in 2020. And it, you can see it particularly in the reds. The reds are this super deep, rich, saturated red that you don't see otherwise. And you can only see it uh, in this movie, if you if you went to a Dolby Cinema, which has a tricolor laser, three RGB laser projector, that's what it uses. Um, but there aren't any other movie theaters that I know of that use that technology, and so they would not be able to show that scene in true 2020. But uh, if you went to a Dolby Cinema, which I did twice, actually... Uh, you can see actual 2020 content, but it's so rare. That's the only example I know of. Um, but eventually, you know, we, we may get there. We may get there close to there anyway with quantum dots. And I didn't even talk about quantum dots because those, those were everywhere at CES too. Vizio, for example, announced that all of their TVs down to the M series, so in other words, the P series and the M series, 
will all be based on quantum dots. And uh, <clears throat> the M series, man, well, they didn't, we weren't talking about pricing, but we know that Vizio is a value leader. I mean, they, they make really good products for really good prices. I've recommended them for years. And, and these are going to also be, you know, uh, remarkably affordable. And quantum dots have very narrow spectra. So the green quantum dot is a very narrow green. And the red and the blue are all, well, blue is from an, L, from an LED. So that's not quite as narrow. But the red and the green are very narrow, which gets you out close to 2020. And so with more quantum dot sets and maybe even quantum dot mastering monitors, we might start seeing content that is mastered closer to 2020. Um, I don't think that's going to happen for a number of years yet. Uh, but, you know, we did see quantum dots uh, in a, a lot more TVs. Uh, let's see. Who else can I say hi to here? <clears throat> uh, let's see. Ta Tachi, Taki, uh, just got a 4K TV with HDR. OMG. Yeah, man. That's that's an awesome picture. There's no question about it. When you see a good HDR image, though, and I hope you got a, a UHD Blu-ray player, too, uh, although streaming has gotten really good, really good. So uh, streaming F, uh, high, high dynamic range HDR uh, from Netflix, uh, Vudu, Amazon, uh, they all look really, really good. Um, our Chandra, yes, is talking about Foot Lamberts. <laughs> And, uh, yes, the, the re we used to talk about foot Lamberts a lot as a unit of brightness. And, uh, now we're, we're using nits, which are about roughly a third of, of a, of a foot Lambert. So I, it's just the way we, the way we have, have m moved on. UJ, uh, I heard the Wolf projector demo in the Venetian was very impressive. Yes, indeed it was. It was gorgeous. Beautiful. A JVC also in the Venetian had um, a beautiful picture too. Those are very similar projectors. They're both based on JVC's 8K E-Shift, which we saw at Cedia last September. Uh, and both of them looked just stunning. Just stunning. Uh, those were on like 120 inch screens and they were using bias lighting, which I thought was very interesting. Joe Kane is a big proponent of bias lighting with a projector. Now projectors produce a much less bright image than a flat panel. Flat panel can get up to a thousand nits, 2000 nits. We saw some examples on the show floor of, of 4,000, three and 4,000 nits. Um, and a projector, if you're lucky, will get to a hundred nits. So, you know, there's a big difference there. Why do you need a bias light? Well, there are those who say, and Joe is among them, and I listen to Joe very carefully, um, that still that say still you want to bias your pupils, which is what a bias light does, uh, to fit within the dynamic range that you're looking at. And so both Wolf and JVC uh, were doing that, and the. You know, it, I had no problem with it at all. It was very comfortable to look at. Uh, the HDR imagery looked phenomenal, phenomenal. So, yes, indeed, the Wolf demo projector was a uh, projector demo was very, very impressive. Another thing we, I didn't get to talk about was uh, uh, AirPlay, and more importantly, iTunes uh, is now going to be on. Uh, Samsung and uh, Vizio and uh, let's see Sony and LG. Um, I, I heard and I'm not I haven't confirmed this, but I have heard that Samsung will have sort of an exclusive for a little while on having the iTunes app in their TV. Uh, but all those companies are going to get it. Uh, the other thing I didn't get to talk about was HDMI 2.1 which uh, LG announced that they were going to have full implementation, which includes a bandwidth of 48 gigabits per second. Current HDMI max is out at 18. So this is a lot more bandwidth and super important for 8K, critical for 8K. There were some 8K TVs there that were showing 8K native content with four HDMI cables going into them. 
uh, it was kind of a special case. So you're not going to get, you can get certain limited forms of 8K over the current HDMI, but it's very limited. Uh, to get true 8K with 10-bit HDR and so on, it's going to take um, HDMI 2.1 at 48 gigabits per second. I saw one demo of, of an HDMI system working that way in the HDMI booth. So I think we're not going to see true HDMI 2.1, 48 gigabits uh, in an LG TV or other TVs till the end of this year, at least. Thank you, my friend. Always a pleasure. Welcome home, and we'll see you next week. I'm going to go soak my feet. Go soak your feet. <laughs> All right, Scott, <laughs> take care. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yeah, yeah, time to talk computers. The internet, home theater, digital photography. We got your smartphones. We got your smartwatches. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. Uh, back to the phones we go. I did mention, didn't I? Yes, I did. That uh, The answer to Joe, the trucker's question about the Michael Kors runway watch for his girlfriend and all Android Wear watches is the watch... Once you, you know, put it on your wrist and you authenticate it or, you know, you put the pin in there, um, it will stay activated for uh, Google Pay as long as you keep it on your wrist for up to 24 hours. At some point, it has to connect with the Internet, apparently, uh, after 24 hours. So there, the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Leave your phone behind. I think touch to pay is awesome. I've used it more and more. You know, when Apple Pay first came out, uh, I used it once. Got some weird looks. I think I used it at Whole Foods, which was one of the first places you could use it. It was, you know, early. Got weird looks. Oh. Huh, huh. People were a little like, oh, you've paid now? Yeah. Now it's so commonplace. And not, not only because of the Apple Watch, but, you know, credit cards can use touch to pay. Other watches, your phones, almost all phones, uh, if they're in the last couple of years, have touch to pay. All the clerks are used to it. It's, it's just very commonplace. And so... I, I don't look, actively look for places to use it, but when I see it, I use it. And it is. It's very convenient. You know where it's really convenient? I don't know if this is your experience. On the phone or on the computer. Apple Pay and Google Pay now are often available at Merchants Online. Amazon Pay is too. And I have to say, I think that that's a good move because it's simpler, I don't have to enter a credit card number, which is always, you know, disconcerting when you're using it, especially if it's the first time you've used a website. And it, and so it's faster, it's more convenient, and I, you always get this sense of it's more secure. I'm, I'm going through Amazon, Google, or Apple. They already have the credentials, and in most cases, they're not giving that information to the merchant. Uh, you know, they don't get my credit card number, so I don't have to worry about the merchant getting cracked, breached, opened up. I think that's a good thing. So I, I always am happy when I see that. And if you are uh, doing online e-commerce, if it's available to you, I would definitely I would definitely look into it. 8888 Ask Leo. Scott Odenton, Maryland. Hello, Scott. Hi, Leo. Welcome to the show. Um, thanks. Um, I had a bit of a customer service issue with uh, Samsung on a uh, Galaxy Tab S4. Mm-hmm. I uh, ordered it on the 15th. On the 18th, was on a truck out for delivery, and that's the last scan they ever got on oh, it. Oh, man. It never made it to my doorstep. Oh, frustrating. It was stolen while it was still in FedEx's custody. And F FedEx would tell me we can't locate it, but Samsung was still insisting I have to wait. Ugh. I didn't get a refund until Wednesday this week. How long was that after you didn't get it? Uh, about three weeks. Yeah, the you know, uh, and then they were they were insisting I need to get a police report, and the police <sighs> said no because I never made it to your address. Yeah, there's nothing to report. And, I didn't get it. Is the report? That's not a theft. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, their their online chat, and I gave up on that because it was very frustrating. But even on the f uh, their phone number, they were just unable to deal with this situation. And you know it happens a lot, and this is a this is a sad thing. And it's not just Samsung, by the way. I see these kinds of stories from Google and others as well. Uh, you know, on Reddit, I've seen this many times, where people don't get a phone they ordered or a device they ordered, and there's a lot of rigmarole. And I think it's because there's so much fraud. They recently uh, caught a bunch of a, a ring. 
I think it was FedEx, a ring of FedEx employees who were stealing stuff. Uh, so this, you know, is I'm sure FedEx, you know, doesn't like it. I think it's really more on FedEx than anybody else to do something about it. Well, you know, I, I hold FedEx at fault, but Samsung should have been able to deal they with it. They should make it easier. More timely. Yeah. I think the issue really for Samsung and other companies is there's also a lot of fraud. People fraudulently reporting the package was lost. And so they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Last September, 11 former FedEx uh, employees and two former contractors for the Postal Service were indicted in Memphis uh, because they would search through the mail and steal the contents. And, you know, if you think about it, phones and tablets, it's obvious what's in the package, you know, based on who it's from and the size and shape. And you know that that's a high value package. It's going to be a phone or it's going to be a tablet. So I'm sure this happens. Uh, you know, I, I don't I won't say a lot, but I'm sure it happens more than it ought to. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry that that happened to you. Uh, FedEx driver in Virginia accused of. Stealing Christmas gifts. <laughs> uh, phones, in particular. And this is the problem is, you know, dealing with these big companies. I'm glad you complained. I, I'm not sure I would... You're right. Your experience with Samsung was terrible and, and should not happen to anybody. But I'm not sure it's exclusive to Samsung, unfortunately. Well, also, they were inconsistent as to whether I'd be getting a replacement or just a refund, but... Yeah. I eventually got the refund. Good, good. Um, so that leaves me with... Uh, Some money to spend. To get, <laughs> well, it still leaves me with wanting to get a Christmas gift for my wife. Oh, no, this was a Christmas gift. Oh, how frustrating. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, Gosh, that's I'm looking terrible. for who else uh, makes a reliable and good quality Android tablet, and I'm looking for 64 gigs or more. So you've, you and and you were right to choose Samsung in the first place because they do make the best. Google has gotten out of the business. They do Chrome OS tablets, the Pixel Slate, but they've stopped doing Android tablets. Although it might be worth considering a Chrome OS tablet only because most of them will run some, not all, but some Android apps. But as for Android tablets, I think uh, the only choices that I would recommend at this point would be. Let me see if they still Asus A S U S. Let me see if they still make them. Yeah, they the Zen Pad. Um, and I might still go with Samsung. I just yeah. Well, uh, it I'm puts a, a lot less enthusiastic yeah. about it now. Plus, puts a I'll sour have to fight with them to get the promo price again. Yeah, it puts a sour taste in your mouth. Um, yeah, it's a it's a shame. Uh, I think the Asus Zen Pads are quite good. Um, I would certainly look at them and see if they're comparable in price and functionality to what you want. Might also be worth. Are you going to put uh, LTE in it? Is that important to you? The ability uh, to get uh, Wi-Fi wi will be fine. Okay, good. It, if you wanted LTE, uh, it would be worth going to uh, the you know your favorite carriers store, Verizon or Sprint or AT and T or uh, T-Mobile, and see what they have to offer because often they'll subsidize it just as they would a phone. Uh, but if you're not going to do that. Yeah, take a look at the Zen Pad. I think that's a very good choice. Uh, one more thing. What was the device that you got the pen stuck in? The device? I got... <laughs> oh, those were the days. <laughs> that was a Galaxy Note from Samsung. Uh, was it a Note 8 or a Note 7? It was, it was one where if you put the pen in upside down, I think it was a Note 7, uh, it, would, it would catch something. And if you pulled it out, you could pull it out, but it would then break the switch that detected the pen insertion or the pen release, and that meant that some of the functionality was gone. The pen still worked. Yeah. Any idea if the Tab S4 has that same? No, 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 no. That was the last. Samsung, I think, was somewhat chagrined and fixed that in all subsequent versions of everything else it made. <laughs> that was just a poor design. They made a mistake. Okay, so Samsung or Asus? Yeah. I think the Samsung, honestly, the Samsungs are probably the best out there. But at least there is a choice. Asus makes some very nice ones, and I would take a look at their at their products as well. You might even look at Amazon's stuff. They're quasi-Android. They're based on Android, but they're, they're Amazon-based uh, Kindle products. And those are very affordable. And I think, depending on what you do, if what you want to do is watch movies, they're, they're a pretty good choice.
Leo Laporte. The Tech Guy. Uh, and we will take a break, come back with more in just a little bit. Stay right here. Yeah, I don't think often it's the drivers that steal packages. It's too easy to track track back to them. Although in this case, it sounds like it was his driver. Because they said it got on the truck. Um, I think more often when I look at the arrests, it's it's groups at the warehouses where they have access, you know. And I love my FedEx driver and gave him a very nice Christmas gift because he works hard for me. I get a, I get a lot of packages. A lot of packages. Our podcast today brought to you by Slack. Actually, literally, since we use Slack to coordinate, to produce the content, to keep the uh, the engines rolling, Slack is the way to keep the right people in your team in the loop. It's a collaboration hub for work. And what I love about Slack is that everybody loves it. It's hard enough, I mean, as the boss, it's hard enough to get people to coordinate, to plan, to work together. But Slack makes it easy because it's fun. They love it. In fact, I found out we were using another product, which Slack bought. So, you know, it's there's that. But we were using another product for a long time. And I found out when we, when we moved to Slack, I found out that both Jason and Megan had been using Slack surreptitiously <laughs> to coordinate their program, Tech News Weekly, because they loved it so much and they missed it. With Slack, the right people in your team are kept in the loop. The information they need is always at their fingertips. It all works around channels. It looks, you know, at first it's going to look like messaging with so much more. Yes, it's text messaging, it's voice, it's uh, it's video, you know, uh, video calling. But the channels let you organize the conversations around projects. So we have, I'll, I'll show you our Slack channels. We have channels for every show. We have channels for engineering, for ops, for the, the ad team, for sales. Everything you need, if you're on that team, is in one place. So it's faster and easier to get things done. You don't, uh, what Slack has replaced in many organizations is email. Email is just a nightmare. Firing up the email to figure out what's going on. Uh -uh. Slack is so much faster. It streamlines communication. And integration with the tools and services we need. That was one of the main reasons we went to Slack is because it works with all of the tools that we need. So I'll show you. This is our Slack. Look at the teams. We've got Central Booking, Continuity, Editorial Team, General, iOS Today, Mobile Apps, New Screensavers, Products. We can kill that one. Products for Review, This Week in Tech, Triangulation, Twit Booking. And that's just the ones I'm subscribed to. That's the other thing. You don't have to see more than you need. You subscribe to the channels you need and let others subscribe to the channels they need. Organize your team with real-time mes messaging, video, voice calls, group file sharing, searchable archives. I put a link in here, automatically get a, a nice little thumbnail of the content. I just love Slack. And it's fun to use, too. Drag and drop file sharing works with all the apps you already use, like Jira and Salesforce and Zendesk and Google Drive. But we use, in our engineering team, we use Ops Genie and a bunch of other tools that just boom, 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 hook right in there. Over a thousand apps integrate with Slack. It's there's nobody like it. There's nothing like it, and it works everywhere because it's on iOS, it's on Android, it's on Mac, it's on Windows, and you pick up exactly where you left off, no matter where you fire it up. With Slack, your team is better connected. Learn more at slack.com. S L A C K slack dot com. Slack is on a roll. It's on a tear, and we are so grateful for it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. I'd love to hear from you. Give me a ring. Michael San Pedro, you're next. Hi, Michael. Thanks for hanging on. Did you mean Michelle? Oh, yes. Sorry, Michelle. I misread it. <laughs> I mean I you, know. Michelle. Sorry, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. That's perfectly all right. <laughs> okay. Um, Leo, I, I am such a novice and I don't have the terminology to explain myself very well. But what I want to do, I want to stream movies on my Samsung 
smart. I have the smart hub, and I have a 3D TV. It's very nice, good, great picture. Uh, it's a few years old, maybe five years old, something like okay. that. Okay. But I want to stream, and I don't even know what streaming means exactly, but I want to stream movies. I, I cut the cord. I took my, my Dish Network off yesterday and took it back. And the the appliances, you know, to, to do that. So how can I do that? Do sure. I need some equipment to stream? You may. I have so, the Internet. I have, I have Cox Cable for good. my Internet. Yeah, you need Internet. Uh, okay. streaming mere, merely means getting content from the internet and they call it stream, streaming because you're as you download it you're playing it and in most cases with streaming you're not saving the downloaded bits you're watching them and then they disappear so there are a lot of ways to stream TV there are a lot of streaming providers Netflix of course you know about I, ha I have Netflix perfect they converted from a DVD by mail service to streaming movie service, and they've done it quite well. Although I read the other day that they had 1,500 new shows, you know, Netflix originals in 2018. And I wonder how anyone would find the one they wanted. They're so, that's amazing. They spent $8 billion to create new content in 2018. So that's clearly where they see their future. And this is because the movie industry said, we're not going to give you our best movies anymore. So they said, fine, we'll make Stranger Things and everybody will watch that and the heck with you. So good. So you have the best one for sure. Amazon also uh, offers that to okay. Prime members. Uh, yes, Amazon, Amazon Prime. Prime yeah. Okay. Oh, so there's okay. another choice. And Prime has lots of free movies as well as rental movies. And then Apple, Google, uh, Disney, a lot of companies, Voodoo is another one, V-U-D-U, -U, will sell you a movie or rent you a movie. When they sell it to you, it means you can stream it any time at no additional fee. You basically have the rights to it until you no longer have that account. When they rent it to you, it means you can usually watch it for 24, 48, or 72 hours, depending on the service. And so, how do they bill me for that? Do I have You'll give them a credit card, um, just like you do okay. for Netflix, yeah. Okay. So but you need I a way to connect your TV... Or Sorry? Do I, ha I have to join Amazon, uh, Voodoo? Yes, but it's very Amazon easy. Time. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about how you do this. Some okay. TVs have, and it sounds like you might have this, uh, five years is right on the edge of it. Some TVs have the ability to connect to the internet and have software on them that will let you watch Netflix, Amazon, and, and I, others. I think I do. I have a... Uh, a keyboard and a pad. Yeah, you probably do. It goes with the TV. I have to say, though, especially a five-year-old TV, the software Samsung puts on there isn't very good. And it may not be very up-to-date either at some point. Okay. The best way, in my opinion, to stream is to buy an external box. These were originally intended for TVs that did not have Internet connections. Mm -hmm. But because they're kept more up-to-date, Apple makes one called the Apple TV. There's one you've probably heard of that's very good and probably the first one I'd recommend from a company called Roku, R-O-K-U. Okay. Um, but there are other companies that make these as well. There's an Android version called the NVIDIA Shield that I like a lot. And a kind of the decision about which one to get is based on who you want to get your stuff from. Everybody does Netflix. Everybody. Almost uh -huh. everybody does Amazon Prime. But only Apple can do iTunes. Only Apple can do iTunes. So if you wanted to buy or rent movies from iTunes, then you'd have to get an Apple TV. Roku does everything but Apple. Okay. YouTube, Google Play, Amazon, Vudu, everything. So Apple does everything plus Apple TV. And sometimes Apple's been a little slow to let other companies come on their platform. That's I think that's pretty much changed. So you know, if I would look at a Roku box, they're a hundred dollars, and it would it, you connect it to your internet. You can actually plug it into the internet, which gives you a better result. If you can get if you're near your your router, you can just plug it in. I am. Yeah. Then you put I have it. Have a wireless. Yeah, it'll work. Wire. Wireless router and a wireless modem. Yeah, wireless works fine, but. If you can plug it in, if you're near enough, get a little Ethernet cable, that'll give you even better results. Okay. And at that point, yeah, start with Netflix. You already have a Netflix subscription. What you'll do when you first connect the box, 
You could do this on your TV, too, if you just want to try it. Um, but you'll notice the software, in my opinion, on Samsung is just not as good. But you, 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 you'll probably have a button or a menu command. Maybe on your remote, it'll say Netflix. There'll be a way to get into Netflix on the Samsung TV. You'll log into your Netflix account, and you'll see an interface just like you see on a computer or a tablet with all the movies on it. And Netflix is all you can eat. 10 bucks a month and it's you know anything right. you see on there uh some of the other services are not amazon prime for instance has a bunch of free movies but then there's a bunch of paid stuff as well and you get to choose okay. i i like okay. having a roku box that would be my recommendation with the roku box can i get my regular uh broadcast oh that's another matter entirely mm -hmm. yeah and it, when you get rid of the dish uh -huh. um, you lose these locals. So there's a couple of ways to get local stations. Now, if you're, I think in San Pedro, you're close enough to Mount Wilson that you can get the local LA stations. Am I right or no? And I, I have an antenna and I get them extremely well. Perfect. One little TV in the kitchen. Perfect. So you'll need a way to connect that to that Samsung. Usually that means okay. a digital tuner. Uh, you might, if you want DVR capability, the ability to record shows, which you got mm -hmm. from the di your, you know, your dish, your hopper, if you want to replace that, there's a couple of companies. Channel Master is one. Silicon Dust is another that make over the... And TiVo is a third. I should give you three. Uh, mm -hmm. That will make over-the-air DVRs. You connect to your antenna. They'll, be, they'll, in effect, be just like your cable box or your dish box. They'll, they'll be very comfortable for you. But they come with you know, additional expense. So you might just want to get a little box that you plug into your TV. Uh, then you've got, then you're golden. Then you've got the locals, plus you've got movies. You don't need cable. you got everything you need. I think that's a very good way to go. That's called cord cutting, as you said, and it's all the rage. In fact, I know a lot of people under 25 who never had a cable subscription. <laughs> they said, what do you want to watch anything but YouTube for anyway? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're right, Marsworm. I will mention, in fact, I'll mention it right now if you're still on the line, Michelle, um, that your public library may have movies as well. Are you there? Nope, she hung up. So your public library, uh, you should check with your local library and see if they support digital movie rentals. A lot of them do. And there's apps like Canopy with a K that you can use to, uh, to watch movies, which is uh, for free. You you only get them for a limited time, but it's a great it's a great way to get a small selection compared to say Amazon or Netflix. He's been everywhere, man. He's Johnny Jet. He's breathing the mountain air. Actually, today he's breathing the fresh air of Waikiki Beach. Johnny Jet, our traveling man, is still in Hawaii. Hello, John. Aloha. Aloha. Have you been to a luau? This trip. Not this trip. Not this trip, no. You kind of got to do that, don't I've you? Been. That's the tourist yeah, thing to do. I, I don't like the tourist ones. If you can get more of a local one, they're great. But the, the tourist trap ones I do oh, not no, no, like. No, 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 no. Yeah, you There's got one it. out in Colina that I do not like. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, this is where a travel agent will help you a lot with some Hawaii experience. because What I did do is go to the farmer's market <gasps> yesterday. The size of that. What, what is that, a dragon fruit? What is that? Well, this is a rambutan. This is one of my favorite fruits. My favorite one is a mangosteen, which you can get here when it's in season, but usually you get them in Asia. And same thing with here. You know, if, if I go to Asia, I can get these for like, I can get a, a bag of them for two dollars. This cost me a bag for about five dollars. What does it taste like? A kiwi? What does that taste it's like? Best. You open it up. Yeah. You just peel it. You open it up and you eat the oh, inside. Look at that. that looks so good. You just don't eat the. It looks the like a. It looks like a shave ice. Uh, it's the best. And I'm, <laughs> What's and it called? I'm, a rambutan? Rambutan. R A M B U T A N. Oh, I'm going to try that. So, and, and, Looks like a sea like urchin. A, and once, once in a great while, you can find them actually in Trader Joe's in LA. Oh. Um, and um, Somebody in the chat room says it looks like a, a, a nose that fell off a Muppet. <laughs> it kind of tastes like a lychee. Or oh, a lychee. Nice. Like, yeah, it looks like a lychee a little bit. Yeah. But, but actually, um, I'm at the Ritz Carlton in Waikiki, oh, but gee. the Hyatt Hotel in Waikiki has a farmer's market every Tuesday and Thursday. <sighs> nice. And that's where I got them. And so go into there and check them out. I'm checking out of the hotel very shortly, but 
because I'm speaking next weekend at the San Diego Travel and Adventure Show. So hopefully if anyone's from San Diego, come on down. There's some big speakers. One of my buddies, Josh Gates, who has a show on uh, Discovery is going to be there. And um, Pauline Farmer, I think Samantha Brown. Actually, Samantha's not speaking of that one. She's you can walk in, though, head held high because you have a show on the tech guy. That's right. Yes. So, and I'm speaking both days, Saturday <laughs> and Sunday. Who do you have a show on, Johnny? Tell them uh, iHeartMedia. Tell them I'm on Clear Clear Channel Premier Radio. Tell them, tell them anything. They'll give I'll, you I'll, special treatment. I will tell them. And, you know, so some <laughs> of the things we talked about just before I went on air is about I'll be talking about credit card deals and travel deals. And actually, I have three really good ones right now. Okay. Um, travel deals. Qantas is, has a deal right now from... Um, West Coast, six ninety nine to Australia, nine forty nine from the New from New York. British Airways has a deal, five sixty nine to London, five nights hotel. It's for five sixty nine. Includes five nights hotel. And now you Which, you find out about these by the way if you subscribe to Johnny's newsletter. He won't say this, but I'm gonna say it uh, at johnnyjet.com. And it's free. There's not it's not one of those you got to pay a hundred dollars a year newsletter. It's free. It's so, free. And I sent a deals newsletter yesterday. And the big reason why is because Southwest just came out with a new credit card offer that um, is offering a companion pass. It's the easiest way to get a companion pass. So it's basically buying, uh, every time you buy a ticket, you buy one, get one free. If, and, but you have uh, to use the Southwest credit card, but that's that's an incredible yep. deal. But, and you have to spend, I think, to get the card, you have to spend, I think, $4,000 in the first three months, which, oh. uh, but once you get the card and you get this, right now you have it till the end of the year, and uh, so that's going gangbusters, and you also get thirty thousand points. Um, I might have to get that because we do fly Southwest a lot. But do not get one of these credit cards or any travel rewards credit card unless you can pay your credit card bill off yes. in full. It's every no month. deal if you're paying interest on a credit card. That's the most that's important thing. Not a thing deal, yeah. Because it's not a deal if you can't. If you can, it is a great deal. So keep that in mind. What is your um, talk going to be about uh, in San Diego next week? It's about how to use your miles and points, oh. how to travel uh, well using apps and websites. Everything you and do on this show. It's basically, you know, you know, my segment on Leo Laporte's show. And How can people speaking, find out about this San Diego travel show? How can they? Uh... I'll tweet it out, but it's um, okay. if, if, you just, if you just Google uh, travel, the travel adventure uh, show, okay. San Diego. And actually, I'm speaking at the L.A. one in February. I'm speaking at the Dallas one. You speak at all of them. No, I don't. There's there's nine, I think, and I'm speaking at four. Oh, okay. And San Francisco, I'll be speaking at the Bay Area one. It's in they say San Francisco, but it's really um, Santa Clara. Oh, at, cool. Right across from the stadium. Yeah, but, right where the, the San Francisco 49ers play. Yeah, <laughs> which is nowhere actually, near San Francisco. <laughs> I agree. I mean, actually, the hotel they put us up last time was basically right across the street. Yeah. Um, from Levi Stadium. You know what you're next to though? Google. Yes, I've actually had lunch there a couple times, and that is an amazing experience in itself. But we don't have time for that. I got to tell you some some apps. And Give me websites. an app. Yes. So, so an app. It just came out last week. The city of Los Angeles actually unveiled it. You might have talking about. You might have spoken about it. Uh, Shake Alert LA. Have you heard of this one? I have not, but I'm Shake thinking it has to Alert do with either LA. my ties or earthquakes. Well, if you're in Hawaii, it's about Mai Tais, but yeah. since uh, it's not, it's in LA, it's about earthquakes, it's free for iOS and Android, and so what this app does is it, it gives you instant warning of an earthquake, so the whole premise of it is that they hoped to give you almost up to a minute, depending on where the earthquake um, Oh, that would be is, huge. It could give you up to a minute warning, so you have to make sure that when you download it, that you keep the alerts on, it has your location which a lot of people don't like to have, but if for it to work properly, you need to have that that setting on. And now, if you're on you the know, epicenter, you probably aren't going to get that uh, uh, advance notice because the reason they can give you advance notice is because it takes a little while to get from the epicenter to you. Right. Nice, exactly. shake alert. But you yeah. should have this on your phone. That's a great idea. But I mean, if it can save you, if if it can, if you can get an alert and you have 15 seconds. Oh gosh, to, yes. Get to under a table. Over yeah. Or to get, get in the bathtub. I, yeah. Grab the kids. I mean, um, this is a very important app to download. Actually, I, I I downloaded the other day when it came out, and also, but I've been getting QuakeFeed apps. So I use QuakeFeed. Have you ever used that one before? No. Mm -mm. So actually, I really like QuakeFeed, especially when I travel. So it, what it does, you can set it. So because I live in LA, it 
it will alert me of any earthquake in LA. And I've actually gotten two in the last day. There was just one in um, Ventura, I think. Yeah, see, I don't want to know about the 1.0s. That's well, the problem you, with some of these, right? But you can also set it. But I also get a general setting for anything over a 5.0. That's anywhere what I want to know. Yeah. And well, when you're okay. traveling, especially when you're down in the islands and things, yeah, you yeah. want to you want to know if That's there's a, an earthquake somewhere, a major earthquake, so you can, you know, get to higher ground. Yeah. Because you know. tsunamis often follow earthquakes. Exactly. And, you know. Hmm. So, that's, although that's they usually take more than a minute. So, that's a good one. Quite, it's called Shake Alert, and it's a free download. Is that right? It's free download, iOS and Android. And it's for the and, West Coast of the United States. Yes. Well, that's this is for, it's for LA specifically right now. Okay. Um, but I'm, I know you have a lot of LA readers, viewers, or listeners, sorry. You'll get and it. I'll You'll get it. Just keep trying this different listeners. smellers, touchers, listeners. That's it. <laughs> and actually, I also have a website, which I can either do now or next week. It's up to you. You got a minute. Time. Go ahead. Okay. So this one, actually, I'd like to ask Father Robert about it because there was a big story in the New York Times this past week about how Rome is gross. And that's the name of the blog, the Italian blog that I'm going to mention. But it's in Italian. Father Robert um, lives in Rome, but he does live in Vatican City. So that might be a different... Well, a different country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rome smallest is Smallest country in the world, which a lot of people don't know. Yeah. That Vatican City is the smallest country in the world. But it's called Roma Faschifmo. <laughs> which means Rome is gross. Schifo. Exactly. Roma my, my, Well, my grandparents are from the island of Ischia, which is off of Naples near Capri. And, uh, you know, when I first went to Rome, I was like, this is the most amazing city in the world. And this big story is just saying how it's turning into a dump, well, oh. literally turning into a dump, which is really heartbreaking because I haven't been in a few years since our, my, our son was born. But I really hope it's not true. But one of my buddies who did Johnny, goes Johnny we're out of time. Johnnyjet.com. You can tell me the story later. Johnnyjet.com is his website. Follow him on Twitter at Johnny Jet and Instagram too. Aloha, Johnny. Leo Laporte. Aloha. Aloha. Hang loose, bra. Thank you. So, uh, so give me the uh, Roma S C H I F F O. Is that right? F A S C H I F O. Actually, I just I think I just tweeted it, and I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the show notes right now. Roma fa schifo. And um, anyway, it's in Italian, so you have to use Google Translate unless you speak Italian, which I've lost all of my Italian, as you can tell from my. Um, <laughs> but it's funny because I'm getting an ad for Petaluma <laughs> in Roma fa schifo, which just That's shows you. How uh, how much they how they know who I am, isn't that? Cool? I'm, I'm putting them in the show notes right now. Roma if Fasco. I can find it, there it is. Um, and they also have a Twitter uh, site, which a Twitter feed, which is in mixed English and Italian. That's cool. Roma Faschifo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. <laughs> Kevin in Moreno Valley, California. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you, my friend? Well, I've been on hold and on my cell. My phone's about to die. Let me ask you the question, and if it dies, you can ask me off the air. All right. Uh, uh, we used to have web root. My son asked me, he said, do we want to re-up it? I said, no, nah. Leo says we don't need it. He goes, wait a minute. I thought Leo said we do need it when we, when we got web root years ago. Him and my wife have uh, Windows 10, so I don't worry about that. I've got an old laptop that's just on its last legs. It's six years old. I don't use it very much. I use it just for checking emails. Basically, that's it. Do I need WebRoot? Yeah, so that's what's, that's what's changed. Uh, Windows 10 has a competent antivirus that comes with okay. it. And, okay. you know, you've heard me speak. WebRoot was an advertiser in the day because they were a very, very good antivirus. If you're still right. using Windows XP, yeah, you, okay. <laughs> yeah. You, you, need, you need a lot of help. Uh, so the older the computer, the more important a, a uh, antivirus would be. Okay. Because that's on all our phones, too. Now, is that 
Phones you don't need. No, no, no antivirus ever is necessary in a phone, and that's because phones don't work the same way desktops do. Uh, there's right. nothing an antivirus can do on an Android or iOS device that isn't already being done by the operating right. system. Great. Yeah. Okay. Then that's. And I'll just keep it on my computer. Yeah. yeah. What is it? Windows Seven. What is the? What version of Windows is it? Uh, it's uh, not uh, the one before. Um, yeah, Windows 7, yeah. So 7, you can, for free, download Microsoft's Security Essentials, which is the same antivirus that's on 10. So you can oh. save some money. You don't need WebRoot either. Uh, just use Security Essentials. Now, let me explain, since you, you brought this up, why I've become anti-antivirus. Because I think I, I've uh, you've heard me talk about it before, and I'll, I'll repeat it because I think the message is important. And, and it, it's actually caused a problem because <laughs> I no longer accept antiviruses as sponsors. So, uh, uh, because I don't, I honestly don't think you need one. Uh, the reason is, are multifold. First of all, uh, a modern operating system like Windows 10 or Mac OS is, fu is fully protected in any way that's important. The problem with an antivirus, let's say you get an antivirus on Windows 10. Uh, McAfee or Norton or any of the big names. In order to work, what these antiviruses do is they hook into the operating system fairly at a fairly low level. They become an operating system component. If you think about it, that makes sense. In order to protect you from use, we call the applications and programs you run user land. You're the user in user land. In order to protect you from user land applications, a program probably needs to run fairly deeply in the operating system, below user land. Uh, and so most antiviruses do. There's a problem. If the antivirus isn't perfectly written, if it has flaws, and by the way, all software has flaws, it's now providing a portal for bad guys into the operating system. Oops. You might say, well, that's highly theoretical, Leo. No, it's not. It's happened many times. And uh, it's happened to Norton. It's happened to McAfee. It is not a good thing. You are putting software on there that makes you less secure. <gasps> oh, but it also makes you more secure, right? Because it finds viruses. Well, about half of them. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less. So 50% protection. That means, and by the way, the more modern the virus is, the more likely it will not protect you. It protects you against the old stuff, which is still floating around, to be fair. But any new attack... The antivirus either doesn't know about it or the attack is sophisticated enough to get around the antivirus. It may even use the antivirus. So they don't protect you 100%. <laughs> they give you, by the way, a false sense of confidence because you say, well, I got an antivirus, I'm safe. No. And any, any program you put on your computer, any program you can put on your computer can have the potential of opening doors on your computer. And antiviruses have done that. And because they operate at a low level, it's really serious, more so than a flaw in Chrome let's say. So all of those are, I think, are pretty good reasons not to get an antivirus. There's a newer reason that's even better, which is that Microsoft's antivirus for Windows 10 now is sandboxed. Uh, and this is, a this is a response specifically to this issue of antiviruses providing a route for bad guys to get into the operating system. Because they've sandboxed it, they did this and they said, we've never had the problem, but in case we ever did, because no software is perfect, Windows Defender is going to run inside a, a, a sandbox, which means even if something bad got on your system and, try, and there were a flaw in Windows Defender, it wouldn't be able to get into the operating system because it's protected. It's sandboxed. That's really powerful. It's, it's, it, the application is running in an isolated environment from the rest of the operating system. So even if it got compromised, you wouldn't get compromised. That's huge. Microsoft's blog post said, Security researchers both inside and outside of Microsoft have previously identified ways an attacker can take advantage of vulnerabilities in Windows Defender antivirus content parsers that could enable arbitrary code execution. Those are the three words you don't want to hear. Arbitrary code execution means a bad guy can run their software. The guy who discovered this works happens to work at uh, Google at Project Zero. His name is Tavis Ormandy. He's kind of the, the, the patron saint of this stuff. 
he found a few of these, and he said Microsoft's sandboxing is game-changing. So, Windows 10 comes with an antivirus from Microsoft that's better than any other antivirus for two reasons. One, it comes from the operating system manufacturer, so it gives them some insight into what's going on that others don't have. Two, it's sandboxed. Now, you do, uh, I think, have to turn it on. I'm not sure if it's on now. It might be. Older versions of Windows 10 may not be able to turn it on, but if you have 17 or three late, 1703 or later, you have to do this from the command prompt, and I don't want to say it over the air because it's, well, it's complicated. It's ZX space slash M space MP underscore force underscore use underscore sandbox space one. But I will put a link in the show notes for how you turn it on so that so that uh, you can turn it on and i would recommend it and i think microsoft is going the plan is they may have already done this in the latest updates the plan is to have it be turned on by default soon uh that is huge that is huge so microsoft's doing it right in a way that no other antivirus does microsoft's antivirus by the way is very good Sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, Defender is kind of a junky antivirus. That's actually not true. Uh, it's very good. It's very effective. It's, it's easily as effective as anything else you can buy without any of the downsides. Should you then say, oh, I'm safe, I'm protected, I got Defender? No. No. Don't get that sense of false confidence. You still have to do, you know, practice safe computing, not go to websites that are dangerous. Be very careful about links you click, stuff you download, don't open email attachments, all the things we talk about all the time to keep yourself safe. Most importantly, run Windows Update, you know, have it update regularly, make sure your updates are working, because every one of those updates fixes a flaw that bad guys can then exploit. And by the way, that doesn't just apply to Windows, but everything you run on your computer. And I've added lately an additional caveat, which is do not install more software than you need. Every program you put on your computer can impact its security and its reliability. Only the minimum, and this is true of a smartphone, the minimum you put on there, the better. Just in general. So you don't need malware bytes. You don't need Webroot. You don't need McAfee or Norton. You don't need any of that stuff. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's take a little break. We'll be back with more right after this. Our show today brought to you by DigitalOcean. D-O dot C-O. DigitalOcean, trusted by businesses, loved by developers, including me, including Father Robert. We love DigitalOcean because... It's a way to write a web app or learn how to do web programming or create a uh, first version of an app that's very affordable, very easy. It is awesome. Within a minute, you can provision a server running the operating system you want with the apps you want. You can even use containers like Kubernetes and Docker. It's completely scalable. So you can set it up if you're doing a, you know, if you're just a student, you're learning how to use, a, you know, a Node, for instance, Node.js, you want a Node server, you can set that up and it costs you 0.7 cents a minute, uh, five bucks a month. It's very affordable. And actually, I'm going to show you how you can do it for free for a few months. But you can then scale it. If you created the killer app, you can scale it up with add on storage, security, monitoring, more CPUs more memory, more bandwidth. It's designed for developers. They have a very easy-to-use control panel and an API that lets you spend more time coding, less time managing infrastructure. It's a great way to create a minimum viable product, an MVP, to learn. I use it all the time. Whenever I want to try a new web technology, I have servers at home, but it's just so much easier just to set up a DigitalOcean droplet, put the, you know, it provisioned with everything I need, I can use SSH to get into it. They have a built-in console. I use my SSH keys for completely secure access. It's industry-leading price, performance. They have enterprise-grade SSDs. The lowest price, up to 55% less than other cloud providers. And you never guess, because flat pricing means you know what you pay per month across all data center regions. Regions all over, by the way, all over the world. 99.99% uptime SLA. You get additional features like cloud firewalls, monitoring, alerting, full DNS management. As I mentioned, the global data centers are everywhere. Um, enterprise SSDs, I mentioned that. Oh, the API, I think I mentioned that. It's very easy to use. 
Over 150,000 businesses, including the world's fastest growing startups, rely on Digital Ocean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry leading price performance. Literally, you'll set up an, a server and have it public and ready to go in a minute. Sign up today. You get a free $100 credit. That's going to give you a few months of DigitalOcean. Easy. do.co slash twit. There's no reason not to try it right now. do.co slash twit. Get your free $100 credit. DigitalOcean is... It's really what's changed the world for developers. It's completely changed the world. It's made it so simple and easy to become you know, a web developer, to create a website or a, an app, and, and just take over the world. I think with progressive web apps, it's going to even be better. do.co slash twit for that $100 credit. Well, hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. How you doing? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo. That's my phone number if you wanted to call and talk about tech. I'd love to do it with you. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the uh, U.S. or Canada. 8888 Ask Leo. I put things we talk about in the show um, on our website. That's actually very useful. And when I say I, I really mean James DeRufo, who's writing this all down. And, uh, and of course, Josh Windish, who uh, works out of our office. He not only puts uh, the show notes in there, but links and so forth, but audio and video from the show. Uh, so you can, if you miss a show, you can go back and listen to it again. Techguylabs.com. And no, I don't charge for that. That's free. Absolutely. 8888-ASK-LEO. Oh, I forgot. I have to say happy birthday to Roberto Hellman. He's celebrating today and... He's a good fan of the show, and he wants me to say happy birthday, and I am glad to do so. Happy birthday, Roberto. I think there's an FCC rule against that, but I'm going to do it anyway. Are you? Are, maybe that was, you know, maybe there isn't. Personal greetings, why not, right? No, that can't be illegal. I think maybe, though, I was told it was illegal because it's just bad. <laughs> you don't want to get in the habit of saying happy birthday to people. Maybe that's it. Let's go to Mary in Detroit, the Motor City. Hello, Mary. Hi, Leo. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank goodness you're there. <laughs> what can I do to help you? You're sounds like you've got a tale of woe. Yes, I, I am, am exas exasperated, whatever that word is. That's a good word. Exasperated is an excellent word. <laughs> yeah. what, what's exasperating you? Well, I had an iPod Classic, and the, the last time Apple did the update, and I had a tech person on the phone, and it wiped out all my music. Aye. Then it would not sync anymore. So then I went to Groove, and I was happy for a while until last month when Groove <laughs> went to funk. Microsoft killed Groove. That was their music right. player. Yeah. And now I've been, you know, researching and trying to figure out how to get my music because I have musician friends, so I have their music right. that's not found on Apple Music or Amazon's right. music. And it's like, okay, I I do workshops, I do presentations, I used to take my classic and I would do my playlist from wherever when I plug in for wherever I was when I travel. I'd have my meditation music to chill me out, which I really need right now after this. <laughs> I, I know the feeling. So <laughs> the reason that Apple, and they still make kind of the iPod, but the reason they abandoned the classic, which, by the way, I snapped up because it was the largest one they made. It was 160 mm -hmm. gigabytes. I really liked that. But the reason they stopped doing it is because everybody now has a smartphone, and Apple hopes it'll be an iPhone. And that really is the replacement for the iPod. Do you have a smartphone? I do, but it's not working because it will not. Um, as far as I know, I haven't got been able to get my music on my on my. I'm going to help iPod. you do that. What kind of iPhone? What kind of smartphone do you have? You have an iPhone. Yeah, I have an I okay. iOS. Yeah, yeah. iPhone. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of services that will let you upload your own music to the services and then stream it to your phone. Uh, They'll even let you download versions of the songs to your phone 
this is what's replaced. Part of this is that the times have changed and people have to, you know, we're used to doing it one way and now everything's different. And one mm -hmm. of the things that's different is they don't, ex A, you don't make an iPod. <laughs> they make an iPod Touch, which is basically an iPhone minus the phone. So most people have smartphones, whether it's Android or iOS. But the other thing that's changed is that people generally don't store their music collections on their phones anymore. They stream them. They subscribe to Spotify or Apple Music or Google Music or Amazon Music. And all of those systems have 7, 8, 10 million songs. You know, the idea is every song that you could possibly want that was ever on a CD, you know, ever recorded... You could just stream it, listen to it at your leisure as long as you have an internet connection. And then for the times you're in a plane or you're going to go somewhere where there's no internet connection, they allow you to kind of... Da I put downloads in quotes. It's really cash the songs. Put them on your phone so you can listen without an internet connection. But they'll only be usable as long as you maintain your subscription to one of these services. So that's kind of the way it is now. And kids, my, ki my son, 24-year-old, he doesn't know any any other way. It's all Spotify to him, and you know if it's on Spotify. But you have a really legitimate interest in putting your own unique music on there. None of these services obviously have the stuff that you have. So right. there are a few services that will let you upload this stuff. Google will do it. I think fifty thousand songs of your own. Um, Amazon will also do it. People tell me that Apple will do it. It's not immediately obvious how. So I would I would look at one of these other services. Spotify kind of sort of will do it. Um, and so I would look at one of these other music services, maybe Google Play Music. Use their special uploader on your desktop computer. It'll upload all those songs. You can then download them from the Internet to the phone. You can connect the phone to your computer, copy them over that way, and listen that way as well. Um, and so then you'll get all of those things. There are also, you should be, you may be interested to know, uh, meditation apps for your smartphone. Like uh, the, one of our sponsors is really good for this, Calm, C-A-L-M oh, dot yeah. com. Yeah, they're great. They have them. Yeah. So if you have a Calm subscription, all that meditation, all that music, all of that stuff is also on your smartphone. And you're most of the time you're connected. So, you know, you can access all of that stuff without storing it on the phone. So treat your phone as your iPod, basically. Yeah, it just, I had I had some technicians trying to walk me through it, and they said, well, we just, you can't, you just can't get that. It you, have to con you have to recontextualize, that's why. You're still thinking like an I like it's an iPod, and you put everything on it, and then you play it. You got, you got to recontextualize. So now what we're doing is we're streaming it from the cloud. Your storage isn't on the phone. I mean, you could store it on your phone. How much, how much memory do you have on your iPhone, do you know? I, I think it's 64. Okay. So 64 is plenty for most people. It may not store your, it depends how big your music collection is, but it may not, mm -hmm. but you may only want to put this, for instance, the stuff that you, you know, listen to, make a playlist of you, the songs that you want to listen to and put that on there, for instance. Yeah. And, and you can do that with Apple Music. That's fine. If you yeah, get, if you buy, if you pay 25 bucks a year for iTunes Match, you do have to pay for that. it. Yeah. That will upload everything that's on your uh, computer to the cloud, and then you can download it to your phone. Okay. I'm, I'm mostly concerned, you know, with my friend's music. Yeah. The music that I had done so that I can't get that through. And they were saying it they're, was not. They're wrong. Apple told me they could not. No, they're wrong. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, a lot of times when you call service personnel at companies, they don't know their own products very well. So yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, <laughs> there is uh, the way I do it on an iPhone. I I bought another music program that I like better than I, Apple's music called Vox V O X. You'll find it in the App Store, okay. and and Vox uh, will play anything that's on your phone. So you can sync. You know, you can move those songs onto your phone in a variety of ways. And, you know, you could put them in Dropbox, you could sync them with iTunes, and then have Vox play them. It'll see everything, all the music that's on your phone. But Apple Music will, too. The problem I have with Apple Music is confusing as heck. And I understand this stuff. I've 
but the, it's just there's you know you look at it and you go well where's my music and there's a switch that says well show other music oh it's am I only showing download because they want you to buy frankly they want you to buy iTunes music that's really what's going on yeah you do not that. need iTunes music to do what you want to do cool good. That was a couple of weeks um, handled right here today. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I wish they were a little less dumb. But yeah, me too. Uh, it's they're really it's not so much they're dumb. They have a notebook in front of them, and really, Apple wants you to buy Apple Music. So they're going to say, "Well, no, what do you mean? Why would you want something that's not in Apple Music? Well, you can't do that, but you can. iTunes Match will do it. You could copy the songs directly to your phone and use Vox to play it." Vox even has a cloud-based service that you pay extra for uh, that works quite well, and I store everything I have. That might be the right solution for you, the Vox Music Cloud. I store everything in the Vox Music Cloud, and I completely don't use Apple's system. Apple doesn't want you to know about that one, definitely. So let me see. Let I me. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, get just don't, because Apple's stuff is confusing. So Vox is V-O-X. It's not free, but it's actually cheaper than getting a subscription to you know the Apple ecosystem, it's at vox dot rocks r o c k s vox dot rocks. You can read about it. It's designed for your music wherever you got it. And then if you if you uh, if you want, they even have radio stations on it, which I kind of like. And then if you want to have your your music on their cloud, there's an additional uh, fee for Vox Premium to do that. But you can read all about it at the website, vox.rocks. And the other thing is, it also works with Android as well as iPhone, I believe. So you're not tied to any one service. Wow. Is that right? No, no, it looks like it's oh. iPhone only. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's another, if you do go Android, there's a program called Double Twist that does the same thing. And it's that's iOS and Android. But I like Vox Rocks. vox.rocks. Thanks so much. Enjoy your music. It sounds like good stuff. I want it. <laughs> let me let me hear it. <laughs> I'm sick of those 20 million songs on on uh, Apple Music. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Website techguylabs.com. 8888-ASK-LEO. Let's talk right after this. So, Lurk, was it your first time at CES? Or do you go every year? I'm so glad I don't have to go. You can't upload MP3s to Amazon Music. Well, that's a sad state of affairs. You can to Google. Oh, I remember reading that, yeah. You can on Google, and you can on... Uh, okay, Jake, we'll talk to you soon. And you can on um, Apple with, with iTunes Match. The thing about Vox is it doesn't have this tie into, you know, iTunes and an Apple Music service. So you upload everything. It doesn't care if you, where you, you know, if it's private or or commercial or whatever. You just upload it. It's all available to you. I'm very happy with Vox. I should show you Vox. I'll show you. I show you, man. So this is the the this is the Vox interface. Um, it also supports radio stations. They have, you know, which is really cool. Um, it also supports various collections. They're like playlists. And it copied it over, you can see, from iTunes, which is nice. It also supports SoundCloud. But really, the, the, the key is the library. So everything is synced up to the library. And the, the main reason I got it is because it supports uh, more formats, FLAC and high res, you know, 24 bit, 96 kilohertz, stuff like that. So this is, I don't know if this is streaming or local. Ah. So if I show only local tracks, I'm pretty sure that was streaming. Yeah, this is all that's on here locally. I got a, two Jewel songs and a demo track from Vox. That's all that's on this phone. But everything else is in my Vox cloud, so it's as if it's on the phone, right? So, 
this is I think this is everything and not only as you can see not only everything I have but I think my kids hip hop is on here too <laughs> cuz back this was the none of the negatives of uh, yeah I never bought any Tupac songs I know <laughs> Leo Laporte we were talking about Tupac with my musical director Damien Big Pee Wee we call him he is he is just a musical god and we love him and we love the music he picks for us thank you Damien 8888 ask Leo that's the phone number uh line three is Ron in Warsaw Indiana hello Ron yes good afternoon Leo how you doing ah uh, I'm doing great how are you oh I'm just sitting here listening to you and and looking out at our snowstorm going through. Oh, wow. Indiana. Oh, so, wow. So we got about four inches today. Yikes. Do you have to shovel it or do you have somebody, do you have a teenager? No. <laughs> I'm too old for that part. But yeah, we got to shovel it and push it. Uh, Actually, uh, I don't miss I that. You, I was changing the oil in the uh, snowblower. So we'll get to uh, use that today. I do like snow a lot, uh, but I just don't like, I don't like snow removal. And I don't like the three days after the snowfall time. I don't like that. But And I don't like the cold weather. So that's why I'm in California. What can, what, what, okay, well, that makes sense. What can I do for you? Okay, well, um, a while back, uh, here just recently, uh, we decided to buy um, a security uh, system for the house. Yes. And uh, the house is about 25 years old, and we have casement windows. And the instructions that came with the security system, you know, I can figure out how to put it on the doors, and I can figure out how to put it on um, regular double-hung type windows. Yeah. But my casement window, it cranks out. Oh. And, yeah. Yeah, I know what you and mean. So, so most of these sensors, there's two pieces. They're basically magnets. One piece goes yeah. on, the, on the frame of the window. One piece goes on the window. When the window's closed... It, the connection is closed, but as soon as the window opens, it separates the two, and that's when the alarm goes off. Yeah. So if there's no yeah, convenient like frame and place on the window to place those things, yeah, they're not gonna. That's not gonna work yeah. too well. Because uh, when the window's closed, there's about a quarter of an inch all the way around on the frame that's yeah. exposed. So that yeah. appears to be uh, too small for. Uh, yeah, they have to be right next to each other because it's yeah, you know, it's just magnets. Yeah. yeah, and I yeah, and and what I found and the instructions correct, they have to be within probably two inches to really uh, made up well. Yeah. So that they can see whether they're closed or open. Yeah. But I also have a, a full uh, screen on the inside of the window, and so <clears throat> on the face, let's say on the inside towards the house, when I'm on the inside of the screen, I got more than the two inches that. And, of course, then the sensor thinks it's, it's Well, open. because you're in Indiana winters, I'm sure there's some place where that window closes fully. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right now it's fully closed. Yeah. So there are, um, there are other kinds of sensors. Now, I don't know. The home security company you went to may not offer them. That's the only issue. But there are things like strip sensors that actually are kind of neat. They're inside, they go inside the frame on a casement window. And they're just, a, they're a, maybe a four inch long strip that glues in mm -hmm. right there. And then when the window closes, the other strip, which is also this thin strip, mates. And they're, they're designed for that exact situation. Um, but the question is, will they work with your existing home security system? And that I don't know. You, you, who do you have? Yeah, I don't, uh, it's simply safe. Okay. Uh, a fine sponsor of this show, I might add. Uh, so I like their yeah. stuff, and I have their other contact sensors. I would call them and say, "Do you have uh, something that off that works for these casement windows?" the The company that makes strips is called Sensitive mm -hmm. Strips by Sensitive dot com, and it may be that the signal that they send is the same. In which case, it should work with the Simply Safe. It's a very clever solution for casement windows. Mm, okay. Okay. And it does. Uh, I think they. Uh, uh, let me see who's. Oh, uh, these looks like. I wonder if these are with. They work with. They work with smart things. I wouldn't be surprised if they work with Simply Safe. You know, there's a standard for how these things communicate. But I think mm, the first okay. thing to do would be call Simply Safe and say, "Hey, what do you do yeah. in this case?" Yeah, and and what I called Simply Safe, they said, uh, or they suggested going with a combination of motion sensor, right, and. Um, Let's see, motion Gla sensor. They have glass break also. Maybe that's what, yeah. Motion sensor would tell you if somebody came in the room. Yeah. And the only, the apprehensive I have on that is 
four of the four of the rooms are bedrooms. And there are gonna be the, people in there. Yeah, you don't wanna Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh shucks. There's yeah, somebody in there. We can uh, yeah, we can we can have a lot of people stay over. Um but anyway in, in the one home mode then the motion sensors go off, which makes sense if you're yeah. home and roaming yeah. around, then yeah. the motion sensors would go off. But of course at night then I lose my protection. Yeah. There are a lot of companies that make casement sensors. This is not I mean, obviously casement windows are very common. Uh, and I think the cleverest way is this internal strip thing. But there are other ways, too. I'm sure some of them will work. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. The Gizwa is coming up. Dick DiBartolo, he's back from CES as well. He kind of focuses on the stuff in the back and the booth in the back and the corner in the dark, you know, the little the little weird things, and I'm sure he'll have a handful of them just for us in just a few minutes. But meanwhile, let's get back to the phones. Jake in Jacksonville, Florida. Hello, Jake. Hey, Jake. Hi, Leo. How you doing? Hi, Leo. I'm well, doing great. How are you? I'm very well. What can I do for you today? Uh, I have two questions, but I'll just get to the second one if I have time, I guess. Um, so I was on eBay uh -oh. and I bought a new phone. Oh, yeah. God, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. How's that going for you? At least it's going okay. I mean, at least it's not... Um, at least it's not iCloud locked or anything. An but, empty box. Uh, oh, it's an iPhone. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, there's a there's a great iPhone. deal of trust when you buy on eBay, and I buy on eBay. I just bought a a pen, very rare antique pen, fountain pen on eBay from a Japanese seller. I, and of course, you always look at the rating of the seller and all that. Uh, but he did it. You know, it's beautiful. I you know, it's exactly what I expected. Uh, so you you know, and that's the only place you're going to get that kind of thing. Spying phones on eBay is a little more sketch unless you're buying from an established seller. Were you? Yeah, I mean he he had a he had like a couple hundred uh, good ratings. Okay, ninety nine percent positive. That's so very good. I okay, it was pretty safe. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so I was I was going to get it unlocked and everything to put my SIM in, and this is where I had the problem. So when I go to AT and T's unlock portal. It'll tell me, like, I'll put in the IMEI and stuff, yeah. and it'll tell me that uh, the phone's not paid off. Oh, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I'm just trying to find, I called AT&T, and they, they won't, they don't do, like, over-the-phone unlocking anymore, and I'm just trying to see if there's any way that I can uh, unlock it with AT&T. Well, I, I don't want you to get ripped off any further by going to one of these you know gray market unlockers there's quite a few on the web that will unlock you know you send them 50 bucks and they'll unlock your phone uh but you know sometimes that you don't they don't <laughs> um yeah at&t was as as all the cell phone companies required to do this by the FCC. They, the FCC decided, you know, this whole locking, carrier locking thing, which means you buy a phone from a carrier and you can only use it with that carrier, is only okay if they still owe you money, you know, they're not in good standing. But once you've paid off the phone or if you bought it outright, you should be able to put anybody's SIM card in it. Uh, so that's why AT&T created that, you know, portal it can't be lost or stolen or associated with fraudulent activity. You have to have paid off any fees. You have to have bought the phone. It also has to still be active, which uh, is, I think would have been the stopping point for you. It's interesting. So you gave them the IMEI, and they said, well, you still owe money on it. <laughs> There's not much you can do except go to the buyer and say, hey, pay off your darn phone. I mean, the seller. Yeah, I so I did that. <laughs> I didn't get. I wasn't very lucky with that either because he said he just resold it from some other guy that he had on eBay, uh, and AT and T also told me to try to get some account info. Uh, and the best I could do was just plug the phone into iTunes and check what it said the phone right. number on there was. Right. It was previously registered, but right. Other than that, I, if you can, if you you know, eBay does have a return requirements return policy i would say at this point you return that to the seller and say dude 
this phone is unusable. Because it is. I wouldn't try any third party or tricky unlock stuff. If you feel like, you know, it's hopeless, I'm not going to get my money back, I would I would actually file a complaint with eBay and and also make sure you give them a bad review. Um, but if, if, if you've somehow gotten to the point where it's hopeless, you might, the one thing I might consider is taking it down to a third-party phone store, you know. Not a company, AT&T company store, but these guys who have the little, you know, cell phone shops where they sell a variety of packages and phones often have ways and means that not available to the average dude so it's not my first thing my first thing would be go to ebay get your money back but if that's if you already tried that and it's too late and you can't um you know then i would say take it to this third party shop do not what i would not recommend is going online and buying an unlock code that's almost certainly going to be bad, good money after bad Okay, so there's there's um, nothing that you can recommend. AT and T is not going to be able. To no, they're not going to budge. No, no, that's you know they have their policies. They're not going to budge. Okay, you okay. know that and phone has to be have... paid off, and it hasn't been. Which is funny because okay. that, it doesn't let the guy off the hook, even if he sells it. Maybe he hoped that he would get the money that he, you know, it's it's shady. <laughs> it's shady. The whole thing's shady. It's interesting. It's not iCloud locked. That means that whoever um, sold it uh, took Find My iPhone off, unlocked it. But he, what he didn't, what he neglected to do, was pay off his account. <laughs> uh, and it's what's, so I mean, I don't know of any way around that. I would say I would I would take it up with the seller in eBay and say I want a refund. This is an unusable phone. All right, and do you have time for one more question? Sure, for you, Jake. Right, so anything. All right, thank you. Um, so, um, my friend and I, my friend's working on, um, he wants to record his own music and stuff, and me and him and another friend who uh, is good at producing all of it are uh, just working on getting everything set up. So, do you have any, um, like, microphone recommendations, maybe USB between, like, $1 and $200? Oh, yeah, there's lots of good choices. Um Tell me a little bit about the recording setup. What are you gonna? Be, you're gonna be recording into a computer. Yeah, I, we're gonna be just recording into his laptop. He's and it's voice. Be, you know, doing. You're recording him singing. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah there are a lot of good USB mics out there. Um, the company that is best known for making USB mics is Blue, uh, and they make a number of very good mics at a variety of uh, prices. Um, I think they just got acquired. I can't remember who bought them, but that doesn't mean they still don't offer great mics. The Blue Yeti is often considered the kind of the king of the hill in this, but they have other, uh, you know, depending on your price point, they have uh, the Yeti is ninety nine ninety nine. The Yeti Nano is rather the full size Yeti is one hundred thirty dollars. They have other other devices too. I would say don't get you can't afford the Yeti Pro. That's two hundred fifty bucks. Do not get the Snowball. My experience with the Snowball is it didn't have any headroom. Uh, but I think that the Blue Yeti Nano or the uh, regular Yeti would be an excellent choice. All right. Another good much. choice. Uh, Audio Technica has really good mics. Uh, somebody in the chat room is saying ATR twenty one hundred, and I agree. The ATR mics are very very uh, nice mics from Audio Technica. Um, and they're also very inexpensive. The twenty one hundred seventy dollars, uh, the twenty five hundred, which might be a little bit better, is eighty dollars. Those are those are really excellent mics. All right, thank lots you. of good choices in your price range. Hey, good luck, Jake. Have yeah, fun. Thanks for the help. It's a fun thing to do. Do your own recording. It's awesome. You know what we often use is uh, adapters that will take a professional quality mic and turn it into USB. Sure makes a, a very good one, uh, and they sell a very good uh, mic for a recording called the SM58. Actually, I use the Shure. If you're going into a, a iPhone, uh, the Shure Motive MOTIV line is very good, very very good. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Turn that beat yes. around. Got to, got to feel percussion. Uh, mm. Vicky, what was her name? Oh, I don't know. Vicky. Oh, it's, this is Gloria oh, Stefan. Gloria, Gloria Stefan. No, it's not. 
Oh, she did a different version. Oh, okay. Oh. I, Vicky Sue there Robinson. There we go. Yes, thank you. Thank I you. I didn't realize there was a remix. Nee, this is nee. good. I love Gloria Stefan. I just saw her um the 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 Broadway show on her life that's amazing. I can't remember the name of it. It was really good. Anyway, the reason we play disco is so I can travel down memory lane with this cat right here, Mr. Dick D. Bartolo. He's Mad's maddest writer. And we call him our Giz Wiz, our Gizmo Wizard, because he collects weird gizmos and gadgets. And I think you went to the Mecca of weird gadgets. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I did see a couple of impressive things. Walked by the Bell helicopter built for Uber. I saw that. That looks really cool. It's like a personal autonomous vehicle, but it, yeah. it's a VTOL. It, vertical takeoff oh, and it's, landing. Yeah. It's a quadcopter. It's yeah. six. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, that's pretty neat when on your app call for a helicopter. There was another company making... Uh, autonomous chairs for the airport. They said two uh, two airports have them now. Wait a minute. What do you mean autonomous it, chairs? What does well, that what even you do, mean? It, it looks like it almost looks like an automated wheelchair with a luggage rack in the oh. back. Oh! And you go into the app and you say, uh, "I'm at uh, United Gate 10. I need to go to American Gate 55." Oh. It it comes over. You throw your bag in. It knows where the gate is, and it takes you there. What a, so, this is so. This is for somebody who would normally have wheelchair service at the airport, but there's no driver. That yes, this is this just takes you where you need to go. Oh, that's kind of cool. So, yeah, yeah. But I was looking for the weird stuff, okay? But, you know, the weirdest, Leo, is not even for the consumer, but I thought it was such a clever idea invented by, I think it was a teacher called Stallmate. Oh, no. Okay. Yes, Leo. All right, so at conventions, <laughs> yeah. or a lot of public places, yeah. people take their phones into the stall. Yeah. They often drop them. They sometimes find a little shelf and they forget them. Yeah. So Stallmate is a pocket that is has the latch behind it. So when you come in, you can put your wallet or your phone in that. <laughs> And then lock the stall. You now, know, when you leave, Jennifer, my ex-wife, left her passport and wallet in a French bathroom. It was gone when she went back. She yeah. actually is still in Paris. She could never come home again. <laughs> had she gone to an establishment that, in, that had installed stallmate. So that's clever because when you leave, you have to unlock the door. You're certainly going to notice, oh, there's my phone. There's my wallet. I like their um, slogan. Uh, yeah. Don't go without it. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me want to buy one. Yeah. But this is really uh, for people who have public restrooms, not, uh, exactly, not for exactly. you and me. Yeah. So Unless you have a public yeah. restroom in Disneyland. You might, actually. Oh, uh, no. Well, actually, you you have a, a semi-public restroom. We do, actually. Right? We should get yeah. stall made. You know what? What am I saying? We should exactly. get stall made for the studio. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, and I think it's 20 bucks, but I, they're basically selling them to, uh, uh, corporations. All right. Now there is something that I found called mute plus mute. Plus. Uh, yeah, this is very, this is very weird. So it is to be put on the top of an Amazon echo or the oh, echo. Brilliant. I need this. Even the echo dot. And when you don't want it to respond, you turn this on it produces its own white noise. <laughs> so now I should point out that Echoes, uh, everyone I've ever seen have a mute button, but this is for people who don't trust it. E exactly. And you can, it's a timer. So you can hit it. Every time you hit it, it adds 10 minutes up to 60 <laughs> minutes. It's the where... cone of silence. <laughs> but it's, there you go. But it's That's just for the Echo. It's just for the echo. So I thought, I said, Leo was going to get a big kick out of this. Uh, Mute Plus runs on three AA batteries that are in the box. Yeah. Uh, it, it's $25. I mean, I'm and looking it, at an echo right now. It's muted. It has a red light on it. I press the mute button. It says I'm muted. But who knows? I mean, maybe Jeff Bezos has decided to listen in. Maybe Jamma B put a red button there and it doesn't work exactly. at all. Exactly. So <laughs> get this thing. You put it on top of it. Uh, Unless they're listening. 
Unless they, yes, exactly. Yeah. MySmartLife.com. Um, or, you know what, all this stuff, go to gizwiz.biz. That's Dick's website, and he has it all written up there. What else? Uh, let's see. I, I found one thing. You know, I don't own a car ever in my life. But I went to this uh, company called IAV, and they were showing, this is another techie thing that I thought was amazing. It's called Side Window Entertainment. <laughs> yeah. So, you yeah, know, on your side window, yeah. as you drive, yeah. as you go by any landmark, it lights up and says you just, you are coming up to the so-and-so, whatever it is. So it's augmented reality. It shows you augmented, what's outside the window, but it also yes. shows information about it on top of it. Every restaurant you go by, it's like to book a table at this restaurant. <gasps> I kind of like that. Yes. If something goes by, you like it, you press a button and it takes a photo of it and saves it for you. This is kind of cool. Kids Look, can it's watch It's a little foggy video. out the window right now, but <laughs> that's really cool. Kids can watch videos on it and, and play games on the window. And remember now, it's the side window. <laughs> this is not good for the windshield no. or for the driver. Well, no. But no. wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Uh, yeah. I would like additional information in a heads-up display on my on my windshield. Yeah, but I don't think you want to know everything you're passing and if you can eat at the local <laughs> restaurant and do they have a well, table. No. <laughs> but, you know, that guy's drunk. Watch out for her. She's stumbling. You know, things like that. Yeah. And the other neat thing was they also were working on a system where if you break down – you take a picture of your engine. They they get all the info from via the internet, and then on the picture of your engine, as you're holding your phone, they can draw an arrow and say, "Look over here." Wait a minute, you have to get in the back seat to do that? No, no, no. When you open the when you open the hood. Oh, you got like, one of them in the hood too. Yeah. Wow. No, you're using your phone. You say, "My car stalled." Yeah. And you hold your phone oh. up, and they say, "Oh." Look over there, oh, and an arrow cool. comes up. Oh, that's nice. And it says, see this round circle? Under the, look look on your hood, look under your uh, engine. That is a fuse box. Oh. Pop that open. Ah. Now, see that arrow? That's pointing to the yellow fuse. From what you described, it's the yellow fuse. This that is has the future of all kinds uh, of repairs. Yes, Plumbers, exactly. electricians. Just stick your finger in that socket right there. <laughs> Yeah, we have to we have to test for electricity. This is what this is when you get. This is when I was a kid. Did you ever do that? Call somebody from the just. I mean, it's terrible. Just dial somebody and say, "Is your phone cord long enough?" And you go, "Well, it could be a little longer." And you go, "We're well, on the pole outside your house. Uh, pull on it and tell us when you." Oh, you didn't do that when you were a kid. <laughs> so bad. I know. Oh my I know. God. Well, you can't do it now. Yeah. That's a so Brooklyn you, joke. And it's a Brooklyn joke. Hey, lady. Joke. That, uh, this is a phone <laughs> company. Uh, would you like a little more cord on your phone? I'm, yeah, out, I'm like, outside. Just it, pull on it. I'll, uh, <laughs> tell me when you got enough, and I'll uh, I'll lock it out. Yeah. You see, you would have been good at that. <laughs> I could totally do that. Yeah. Yeah. See, now the cell phone has ruined all that. <laughs> Taking all the fun out of life. Life. There's still plenty of fun at gizwiz.biz. That's Dick's website, G-I-Z-W-I-Z.B-I-Z. -I -Z -I -Z. Don't forget his podcast, too, at gizwiz.tv. And the What the Heck Is It game, a chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. For those of you watching or listening to our live stream, Dick will be taking over the stream in a few minutes for the Giz Fizz. It's hard to describe. Just stick around. <laughs> You'll find out. Thank you, Dickie D. Okay, buddy. Take care. Take See you care. next week. Thanks to our musical director, Big Pee Wee. Thanks to our phone angel, Kim Schaffer. Thanks to you for watching. Have a great Geek Week. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time. Hi, Chris. Hi, Leo. Sorry about... Hi, Leo. Uh, How are you? I'm sorry you didn't make it on the show, but I'm glad to talk to you now. You made it on the podcast. That's pretty um, good. Great.
Um, really appreciate it. I've uh, been enjoying your podcast now for a couple of years. Been listening for a very long time on Thanks, uh, KFI. Lovely. Thank you. What can I do for you? I've been, I've been test driving hearing aids for about, uh, oh, better part of a half a year. I'm on my fifth different manufacturer. I'm a bit of an audiophile, and oh, I just can't find They're it. not good for audiophiles. So okay, just, I, I get, the, the world is about to change, though. I'm going to tell you what's going on. Oh. First of all, these are the ones I use. They're probably ones you tried because they're a very big brand. It's called, it's called Starkey. They're Halos. And they, and you're exactly right because these, these and all hearing aids to date are designed to do one thing, which is amplify the frequencies of the human voice. So all you're getting, and I was very disappointed too. I thought, oh, this is great. This is going to supplement my, my hearing so that the frequencies I don't hear well, it'll build those up and, and everything will be full frequency again like when I was 10. That's not what they do. <laughs> They're designed to make it easier to understand human voices. And so as a result, they sound terrible. If you're an audiophile... You know, I mean, the, the reason I got the Halos is because I can play through the phone. So my iPhone will play audio, you know, music and audio books. And I can even put the iPhone microphone next to something and have live playback so I can. But it, the sound is terrible. It sounds like a telephone. It's 8-bit sound almost. However, this is all about to change. So there's, so there, is that a puppy? <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll laugh. Um, I, I couldn't wait. I had to leave for the bank, and uh, my Aussies didn't get their recording oh. because of the rain. So um, I've got them in the car with me. I'm sitting in front of a bank, but I'm really glad to oh, be Oh, I'm talking. glad we could get you on. Are we Australian Shepherds? Yes. Yeah, we, Lisa really loves Australian Shepherds. They're really smart, right? They're great, yeah, yeah. and very um, just very affectionate, too. So Resound, R-E-S-O-U-N-D, and I'm going to test these on Monday. It's funny that you should call, uh, is a well-known uh, hearing aid company. And they now offer rechargeable hearing aids that they claim offer full-spectrum sound. I don't believe that, but I will try them, and I'll get back to you. But here's why everything's about to change. And you can thank uh, Elizabeth Warren and some others in Congress for this. Hearing aids are about to go over the counter. So you went to an audiologist, as did I. And I don't know if you've yet been quoted a price. <laughs> but they're about $6,000 a pair. And that's insane. So the FDA has created a new category for hearing aids that allows them to be sold over the counter. Uh, this is part of the FDA's Reauthorization Act. Um, so they had to create a category for OTC hearing aids. Now, they're not out yet. Uh, when they come out, I would expect, I'm seeing companies like Jabra and others start to offer things that are, you know, in-ear, like, you know, Apple's AirPods, but they're small and they're in-ear and they're full sound. And I bet you that a lot of these companies are just waiting for the over-the-counter market because they'd like to sell for, I mean, they could, they'll could they still cost maybe 2000 or 1000 but that's a lot more than headphones, and that may be a huge boon. I use a number of Jabra, and this, these might be a solution for somebody. It depends how bad your hearing is. I use um, a number of Jabra in-ear earbuds. They're Bluetooth, um, and they, in some cases, will allow you to play through sound, so your phone could act as a microphone, and they could be used as hearing aids in that regard. Um, they're rechargeables. The new Resounds are also rechargeables, which I think is an improvement. These are full spectrum. They, but they're not for everybody because a lot of the reason people use hearing aids is they don't understand their loved ones. And so these hearing aids really do accomplish that thing. They, they give you, you know, you can, you can understand speech better. But that is not what you're looking for. It's not what I was looking for either. I, I hear speech pretty well. What I'm really looking for is something that will give me full frequency hearing. And I bet you that's what you're thinking of too. 
Well, it is. Plus, uh, being able to hear my wife when we're uh, sitting well, either at the dining room table or that, that's what these the that's what these are for. My wife insisted. <laughs> she said, "You're not wearing your that's hearing right, aids, man. are you?" <laughs> <laughs> I say, "Honey, it's not that I don't hear you. <laughs> it's that I'm not. A, I'm ignoring you." <laughs> um, I think this is re this whole category is on the cusp of changing and changing in a way that will respond to that thing that you're interested in, which is getting full quality audio. But that's not what hearing aids, the current instruments that are sold today are for. They're just for better, vo better voice understanding. And they do a great job, but if you're an audiophile, they could be a little annoying, to be honest. Very much so. Yeah. Um, so I think I've tried the resound um, and... Uh, gosh, you know, I started with the uh, really inexpensive ones that uh, are always advertised on uh, Fox. Yeah, not those. Network. Not those. Oh, yeah. my God. Those. No. Terrible. I'm up to the uh, the seven and $8,000 hearing aids now, um, and, and I'm just frustrated with them. The apps are pretty cool. They'll let you adjust the frequency, uh, a minimal equalizer type of yep. uh, ability. Yep. They customize different programs for me, and they're trying really hard, but... Um, it's almost just better if I take my hearing aids out if I'm going to yes. listen to music or a movie. Oh, but see, that's the other thing to understand, and I think a lot of people don't. They 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 think us oldsters, and you know, my damage comes from years of wearing headphones and radio. They think us oldsters are missing sound. It's not that we don't. It's not that we don't hear full frequencies. Just some frequencies are attenuated, but we hear what's going on. Uh, and I think we. I still appreciate music just as much as ever. Um, a little equalization can help it be even more, you know, uh, listenable. But oh, so she's fine. <laughs> oh, she's so cute. I want to give her a hug. So I, she I think that uh, you're what you're. I've encountered the same thing. I'm going to listen to these, you know, new resounds. They just they're you know on Monday. I'm, but again, I'm going to the audiologist. It's still through an audiologist, and I think that there's good reason for that. You know, you do want so how newer. How new is new? Well, that's a good question. I saw uh, Resound at Pepcom, which was uh, in December, and they were very excited about this. So I don't know if this is one you've tried or not. I w you know, call me next week and I'll let you know, or I'll talk. I'll probably talk about it on the air because I think this is a, a good topic. Yeah, um, but I think we're still going to be disappointed. What will change is, in if and it won't be right away. It'll be the next few years. Is when traditional headphone companies. Companies that make high-end audio headphones get into the hearing aid business. And I hope that that's a market that's going to happen. And, and along with that will go this kind of a new category called hearables that will also, you know, these jobbers can see my um, blood flow. They can do my heart rate because they're in my ear. They can even see a VOC, you know, a oxygen uh, volume. And so that's really intriguing. And I think these are a first step in that direction. So... I, I think this is going to be an interesting category, but it's not there yet. So I understand. It would also be great if they could uh, figure out a way to use the microphone that's in the hearing aid so that right now I've got my hearing aids in. I'm listening to you through them right. on my iPhone, and I'm yeah. having to hold the iPhone up to my mouth. Wouldn't it be great if the microphone in the hearing aid would pick up my voice? Right. I wouldn't have to hold this, right. this phone up to my mouth. Yeah, that's, you know, that may come as well. Um, I think there's a lot of room. You know, these guys are fat and happy. Uh, it's a very high profit industry. They have used a lot more computerization. They're using DSPs now. These things do some, you know, you don't get the feedback used to be a big problem with hearing aids. You know, grandpa's hearing aids was squeal. That, that, that never happens anymore thanks to DSPs. Um, they're also very good even in wind where you'd expect some problems that they've really done a lot of stuff when they now aim towards the voice. So, uh, they can tune the left, right ears so that you're hearing whoever's talking better. There's and, and reduce background noise. They're doing a lot of interesting things, but the goals are different than your goals and my goals. Their goals are to make voice more intelligible. And that's why you're not getting what you want and what I want, which is an audio file experience. Well, I know I'm challenging my audiologist, and he's doing what he can to adjust. Uh, he understands that, though. I mean, he understands what you're looking for. 
Oh, absolutely. Okay. I, I, I'm working with a great guy. Good. Um, Good. And actually, I'm working with a second one, um, and uh, she's she's doing the best she can, too. Yeah. Uh, but it, it does seem like my requests are, are just simply not available. Yeah, I don't think so. And uh, and I talked to the Resound people, and I said, this is what I want. And they kind of looked blankly at me. I think, <laughs> I, I really think that they're not... Were you talking to them on the phone? No, no. <laughs> I was in a... In a, in a <laughs> trade show and they were showing them off they said oh you gotta try these and i said no you know because this is not what i'm you know plus they're in such a high profit margin industry i you know i just feel like somebody like apple is going to come along and do it right i well, hope that's that would that would be great so i guess i'm going to have to bite the bullet uh spend my money now and maybe in a few years get an upgrade I'll, over yeah. the counter yeah, I mean that's what I did. I bought these a couple of years ago, and and I don't wear them that often because there's, you know, it's I only wear them in situations where I really need to understand what's going on. Like I like you wouldn't wear them to the theater because, you, yeah, you hear the voices better, but you don't. But the rest of the stuff is annoying. You hear people's rustling their candy and stuff. It's not. It's a, it, it's disappointing. <laughs> I tried a one ear, one in, one out oh, solution for yeah. um, actually the, the the theater, as in seeing a play. Yeah, and that worked pretty good. I'll have to try uh, that. Yeah, I just don't wear them to the theater to the plays because I, you know, I just sit closer. <laughs> and I can hear. <laughs> hey, it's great to talk to you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for your time. All right, my pleasure. Bye.